morning, everyone. Welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Yes, thank you. Good morning. I have a couple of announcements. Um, first, uh, actually, a couple of agenda changes. Um, the first one is already been um, taken off the agenda uh, a couple of days ago. And that was, um, we had planned to talk about the Health Information Exchange Consent Policy. Uh, we were asked by the legislature to hold off on that. They want to take that um, discussion over to the State House um, in the House Health Care Committee and the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. So we'll be um, staying tuned and working with our partners at PIVA and with Vital and the legislature on that. The other item is actually an agenda ad addition for today, and that is um, the budget adjustment for um, two hospitals. Um, they're requesting FY19 adjustments for provider transfer and acquisitions, and they are NBRH and Brattle Memorial, Memorial Hospital. So I'm looking to the team over there to, to, to see where we're putting this, would it be after the Gifford presentation? Okay, I see nodding heads. And um, <coughs> is that okay with you, Mr. Chair? It is. Okay. Uh, and I just remind folks to sign in at the back table if you haven't already. And that is all I have to announce today. Would you like to announce the changes to the March 20th agenda? Um, what changes are you talking about, Mr. Chair? <laughs> so we will be starting at uh, 1 o'clock, not 1.30. Yes, or it may be closer to 1.15, but we will um, send that out on our press release. And if there are any questions, folks can contact me or Christina. Okay. Thank you. The next item are the minutes of Wednesday, February 27th. Is there a motion? I'll move approval. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, February 27th, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so we're going to move right into um, the beginning of this morning's conversation. That's um, dealing with a request from Gifford. Um, for a budget modification. So I'll turn it over to the team. Good morning. Um, my responsibility should be a different recommendation to this. And Gifford um, sent the board a request for modification on February 14th. We had mentioned this to you on February 20th. And we received additional information uh, from Gifford by the board's request, and then the staff was to give you, you our recommendations. So this particular slide is showing what Gifford submitted for 2018, the 55 million post budget, their growth was a negative 6.1%, and their rate request was four. The board approved the uh, NPR, but they put the uh, rate change to 2.75%. The hospital is asking to be reinstated to the 4%, so an increase of 1.25% to be no earlier than March um, 18th. This is incorrect on the 14th. They will be mitigated effective for the 18th. And you can use it in the if you have any questions. <clears throat> so staff recommends the approval of the 4% because Gifford's first quarter results for the operating margin was a negative 1.6%. The total margin was 1.4%. Their day's cash on hand was 210 days. Days payable 41.2. Days receivables 36.3. They also, in their documents that they sent us, they had less expenses for the first quarter 19 at 1.2 million compared to first quarter 18. 
They also would like to have this increase in rate because of their workforce issues. They've been using the temporary staff. And also they've been having employee survey um, that says their employees feel that they have less compensation based on the market. And they also have not received a raise since 2017. Yeah, poor operating margins for this hospital have been for the last two years. Okay, so um, I do see that uh, Dan and his team are here. And Dan, maybe you just might want to address um, why you feel the need and what you're going to use it for. And um, maybe you could just briefly update the board on efforts that you've uh, made to uh, reduce the expenses to bring them in line with the uh, uh, slow uh, NPR growth. Sure. You, you can do it right from there. Just do it from there. Okay. Stand up. Um, so as we uh, outlined in, uh, in discussions ahead uh, as well, um, we are uh, asking for this for two, for two main reasons, as Laurie had outlined. Uh, the first being uh, all the pressures that uh, people are feeling in healthcare across the state of Vermont. And I don't think it's just the state of Vermont um, and in other industries as well around uh, being able to retain and attract uh, qualified uh, individuals to work in our organizations. Uh, it's becoming more and more difficult. I think the, um, uh, the unemployment numbers just came out the other day. It was the, it was the lowest, was it the lowest ever or the lowest uh, in recent memory? Uh, the workforce issues are real. We're feeling them, everybody's feeling them. Uh, as Lori noted, uh, we did not have the ability to provide a uh, a wage increase program at Gifford last year, so uh, this is uh, a need that we have to uh, continue to, to work to get our, um, to be able to um, compensate our people to the rates that we need to, um, to make sure that we're keeping up with the market, to make sure that we're able to staff programs. Um, the board has heard from Gifford and from, I think, every other hospital uh, in the state of the pressures we felt around workforce around workforce issues, the need to bring in uh, temporary uh, staffing, uh, traveling nurses, uh, locum physicians, et cetera. Um, we need to get ahead of that curve. We're doing a better job of, uh, of uh, reducing uh, our utilization of uh, travelers and locums, but uh, we need to continue to invest in our workforce so that uh, we can continue to provide the services that are needed in our community. Uh, so uh, a big part of this is to uh, allow us to be able to continue to make those wage, um, uh, to invest in wages for our in compensation for our uh, employees. Uh, the other part is, uh, as Lori noted, our last two fiscal years uh, have been poor, and uh, we are making improvements in that area, but we need to continue to accelerate that. Um, uh, we. Um, uh, have focused in three areas. One is uh, getting our workforce where it needs to be so that we can return our services to uh, our historical levels. Uh, we are seeing some improvements there, but that takes a lot longer. It's a long, a long range uh, item. Um, uh, the second area we've been focused is on our cost reductions, and I think you'll see in all the documents that you have around our uh, whether it's our year-end 18 or the, um, the quarter-end results that you have for 19, that we've been quite successful in reducing our cost. We submitted some additional materials to the board uh, through this request that uh, give uh, an outline of what we were able to do in fiscal 18 to reduce cost, and then what we've uh, been focused on thus far in fiscal 19, our cost. Uh, at this point in our fiscal year of 19 compared to 18 are significantly lower than uh, uh, in 19 than they were in 18, so we've seen a lot of success in doing that. Uh, our people are doing an amazing job in uh, reducing expenses, um, and that has um, uh, had a large part in uh, our being able to make some improvements on the financial end. Um, uh, our third area that we've been working on is our community outreach. 
Uh, we are doing a lot more in the community, which is uh, important uh, for many areas, but it was also supportive of uh, population health um, activities that we're working on uh, and supportive of the overall uh, activities uh, uh, in that area. So those are the three areas that we're working on. Um, um, I, did, I, uh, did I cover all your questions? Kind of. Um, maybe you might want to expand on population health as far as I understand that uh, there's some side of the news with RISE. I'm sorry, the last part? Um, RISE Vermont? Yes. Um, so we, um, just to go back a little bit, we did join um, One Care Vermont in January, so we are now participating um, for the Medicaid program. Um, and uh, we are working well with One Care. We're still uh, obviously in the very uh, infancy of that program for Gifford, but uh, we are working well uh, with that. I can't give you any um, indication of financial results with that yet. It's just too early. Um, we have um, had a presentation from RISE Vermont, and uh, we do feel that that is a, um, uh, a very good fit with uh, the services and programs and community outreach activities that we already have in place. Uh, we actually think it's, a, it's an excellent fit. Uh, we have decided to move forward and uh, participate with RISE Vermont. We think that that's going to help us to accelerate our efforts, give us more resources to bring to bear in our community, and we think it is going to benefit our community and uh, benefit Gifford's efforts in that, um, uh, in, in that area. So we're quite, uh, we're quite excited about that. So one thing that's uh, um, encouraging, at least from the board's perspective, is that you're still healthy on your day's cash on hand. But are you confident that you can um, bring in the expenses so that you can um, actually have a, a positive margin so that um, you won't have to uh, dip into those? We think we have a fighting chance, yeah. You know, I can't sit here yet. Um, uh, we have four months results um, to say exactly where we're going to be, but we think we have a fighting chance to, uh, to, to break even or better this year. Um, we are continuing our efforts, and I think I outlined um, we have a group that meets on a weekly basis that is uh, um, working with our staff to generate ideas uh, to continue to become more efficient, reduce our costs. That is uh, analyzing, um, getting data uh, to assist with those efforts and then is going back and looking to see whether we've been successful and then what next. So we're continuing to do this on a daily basis. We meet on a weekly basis to, um, uh, to, to really bring that core group together on these cost um, initiatives and that's something that's going to continue forever um, uh, for us. So um, again, I feel um, uh, quite proud of uh, our group and uh, the work that they've done uh, if you look at the cost reduction um, that we have in the materials that you have available to you, you, you see the, um, you'll see the results of their efforts, and um, that is going to continue. Uh, we, uh, we, we do have, um, uh, you know, our, our day's cash on hand has been, has been relatively healthy. Uh, that being said, when you uh, are not generating uh, cash flow from your operations, you have to dip into that, whether it's for capital, whether it's for investments in your uh, staff or, or what have you. So we don't want to rely on that forever. We need to have uh, a healthy day's cash on hand um, as any uh, organization uh, needs to have. So that's not something we want to continue to uh, dip into. So to your point, yes, we are focused on uh, having our operations uh, uh, be back to the um, be back to the point where we can be generating the cash flow from our operations so that we can support our capital, our other needs, uh, invest in our uh, staff and what have you. So um, that is our goal. And I think, again, we have a fighting chance, yes. Are you currently in compliance with all your bond no loan covenants? Uh, we have two covenants uh, with our bonds. One is days cash on hand, which uh, we have no issue with. Uh, in fiscal 18, uh, we did uh, dip below um, our requirement on the, um, um, on the debt service coverage ratio, um, which largely is a reflection of your operations and whether your operations are generating the cash necessary to cover your, um, your immediate uh, debt, debt needs. Um, we've been working with our bank. Uh, we've been working with our auditing firm. 
Um, and uh, we are just waiting for the attorneys to uh, uh, finish the paperwork uh, that will uh, provide us with a waiver for that um, for fiscal 18 and have um, uh, a, a new uh, covenants uh, for the next, uh, for this fiscal year. Uh, as of now, once we sign those, we will be in compliance, but as I stand here today, that's still in the works. Okay. And you know, you're kind of uniquely situated geographically when it uh, comes to um, higher education being located in Randolph with Vermont Tech, but also very close to Northfield. And I'm curious if um, you believe that your partners in higher education understand the gravity of the workforce shortage in Vermont, and is Gifford itself doing everything that it can as far as clinical placements? Because we continue to hear from um, higher ed that <coughs> they could actually take more students if they had more clinical placements. Mm -hmm. So Gifford, um, so yes, we are in the same town as uh, Vermont Tech, and we're 12, 15 miles from Norwich. Uh, we do have clinical placement arrangements with both schools for their nursing students. Uh, we work quite closely with them. Um, and we are uh, every year taking, I, don't, I can't tell you how many off the top of my head, but we are taking new grads uh, from both programs. Um, so from our standpoint, uh, and to my knowledge, they're doing um, what they need to do and they're working well with us. Um, and I know they work with other parties as well uh, along those lines. Um, we also are uh, investing in uh, workforce beyond that. Right now we have a uh, certified medical assistant program that we're doing. Um, this is the second time we've run this program where we have people who apply who want to uh, further their, their job skills. Um, they go through a program with us where um, uh, we are um, uh, providing education, training for them, on the job training. Uh, we um, provide them with assistance so that they're ready to take the certified medical assistant certification. Um, uh, the last go around, we have a group right now that's in the, in the middle of that. Uh, the last go around, um, we had a number, of, I, I think it was, it was five people. Um, they all passed uh, their test. Uh, they're all offered uh, uh, positions at Gifford. Uh, this group, assuming they all pass their test, they'll all um, be offered positions at Gifford. They all already have designated slots where they will go. Um, and then um, that uh, wraps up the end of March. Um, we already have plans for another program that we'll do. Um, we've had a number of uh, individuals uh, from within Gifford who said, this looks good. We're interested in it. We'd like to throw our name in. So it looks like we're going to have another uh, uh, another group of people who's ready, who are ready to jump into that program. So uh, we are um, uh, we are actively investing in that, uh, and the need is the need is there as well. Thank you, Dan. Are there questions from other members? Uh, I have a question on your NPR and whether your new forecast is realistic. And the reason I say that is um, your new forecast is up 9% from your 2018 actual. And the information you've given us so far through the first quarter, you're down 5% against quarter 18, the first quarter to first quarter actuals. So to turn around and be up 9% for the year, we're going to need to see significant growth in the second, third, and fourth quarter. Then the last four years, your trends have been against prior year actuals. In 15, you were down 7.5%. In 16, you were up 1.7%. In 17, you were down 09 In 18, you were down 10 And now you're going to turn around and be up 9% when you're down 5% in the first quarter. So the concern is, I, I appreciate everything you guys are doing with the cost savings, and I think you are really at attacking that. Um, but again, if we have an unrealistic top line forecast, you could continue to have a, you know, a big loss at operating margin. Um, so I'm just hoping this isn't you know, aspirational. Your first quarter came in at 12.3 mil, 12 million, right, which would straight line to 48 million, which is what you came in in 2018, and your forecast is 53 million. So are we really gonna get that ramp up? Because I just wanna make sure you've got a realistic number in here, 
And I think this is something we really should be following up quarterly to be tracking where you are quarterly against the numbers so we're not surprised by, um, you know, last year you had a net operating income target budget of 1.3 million and you came in at negative 5.4. So the past two years you've had operating losses. I'm afraid you're gonna have an operating loss again this year. Um, so just where do you think you're gonna be for NPR? So I would uh, go to the last statement you, you um, the last part of your, of your question. Um, we are focused on, on the bottom line. Uh, and when you look at um, how we've been managing our finances over the last uh, over the last several over the last several months, um, we are managing our expenses to our to our volumes to our revenues. So uh, as our uh, as our as our volumes and our revenues have not been where we expected them, our expenses have followed track. And in fact, our expenses are are. Uh, lower have gone down more than our, our, our revenues um, have. So uh, we are managing that uh, responsibly. So as to whether it's aspirational, no, I don't think the bottom line is aspirational. Um, on the NPR, um, we are focused on our volumes, we are focused on our revenues, but uh, we are um, you know, focused on the whole picture uh, on, on, a more, on a greater basis. Um, what we are seeing right now is we are seeing um, our uh, primary care uh, volumes continue to ramp up. Um, and again, that's an area that we've uh, needed to be focused on in the last few years. Um, as our um, primary care volumes ramp up, um, there are more people in our system. Again, returning to the, those uh, more um, traditional values, our traditional volumes that we had. Um, we have two new um, general surgeries who started in August. Uh, they are beginning to ramp up their, um, their practice. Uh, that does not um, happen quickly. Um, when you bring in somebody, uh, there's a time period when they ramp up. Uh, the last couple months, we've seen that that has uh, begun to accelerate. Um, one of the areas, and I think they noted it in, um, I think they noted it in, I either noted it in our in a conversation that I had with uh, Chairperson Mullen, or um, I don't know if it was in the, um, I can't remember now if it was in what I submitted, but um, one of the things we're seeing is our, uh, our orthopedic volume actually is, uh, has been up in terms of our inpatient surgeries that we've done, but our days are down significantly. Uh, they're down 160 days um, uh, compared to the length of, if, you, if we had the same length of stay we had the prior year, um, our uh, orthopedic days would have been 160 days higher. That would have um, made our, um, our, our revenue and our net patient revenue higher than it is now uh, in what you're seeing, but uh, it's the result of something good um, in what we're supposed to be doing, which is to uh, be lowering the cost of care for uh, people in our communities, um, uh, getting people on their feet and out of the hospital quicker. Um, so all good things. But on the revenue side, on the net patient revenue side, it shows up as a negative. So, um, uh, you know, we're doing the right thing, and uh, we're going to continue to do that. And again, we'll be managing to our bottom line, and um, you know, I feel confident that uh, we'll have uh, better results as um, uh, because of that. Uh, we also had, thank you, Jeff. Uh, we also um, had some. Um, we had some equipment issues in our OR, and our endo system was down. <laughs> for a couple weeks, and uh, it was two to four weeks uh, over the first quarter, that had an impact as well. That's back up, we're um, uh, back at full speed there. So we had some things that happened. Um, you know, we think our net patient revenue is going to continue to um, be higher, uh, and we'll continue to come back and, uh, and talk with you about that. Um, I will say that um, uh, one thing that's been helpful to me, and I hope helpful to the board, the communication, the regular meetings have been better, um, uh, and that's a, a you know I think um, a, a good effort on both on, on both sides. We'll continue to do that, um, and we'll let you know what we're um, experiencing on a weekly basis, monthly basis, whatever um, whatever makes sense. Thanks. Other questions, Tom? <coughs> Just a couple. Um, your uh, list of uh, savings opportunities, uh, which was truly impressive. I mean, it's down to $100 items. Uh, so it sounds like you scrub things pretty well. Um, 
But one that I noticed that you didn't book was your um, low sense of staffing. Um, it was, and I'm just curious as to where that stands and, and what, what savings value that might be. Um, so that is, um, we, we gave what the, um, what we, uh, what, what the FTE savings was on that. Um, it's, it, it would be 6.8. Like so, um, so again, as I mentioned in the previous question, um, uh, we're looking at managing our expenses to our volume. So if we're seeing that our inpatient volumes are really low, uh, we're instituting low census, which means that we're calling some people off. If we know that um, we have two surgeons on vacation in the coming week, um, again, we're doing the same thing. Uh, and it's not just in the areas where, um, um, it's, it's not just in the nursing areas, it's not just in uh, food service or nutrition services. Uh, you know, we're, we're taking time off if we're seeing that, um, uh, that we're gonna have low volumes coming up um, and whatnot. So um, we could go in and get the dollar amount on that. It would be, uh, you talked about really scrubbing, that would be really scrubbing. So um, uh, we, um, we went back and looked at that so that we could at least uh, mention it in this, um, in this submission. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a fairly complicated um, uh, math uh, that we have to go and to look at it on a person by person basis. Uh, and just because of time constraints, we weren't able to do that. We can continue to try to track that better in, for future, but um, when you look at the, uh, the amount of, that, our, um, that our expenses are down in the first quarter, um, it's in there, um, and that has a, it has a profound impact, but I don't have a dollar amount for you today. Um, next would be, um, in terms of your non-operating income, uh, it looks uh, to be a fairly large bump over um, the 2019 budget from 849,000 to 1.1839% 1. 1, uh, <coughs> increase, and you know I, I understand uh, non-operating income can fluctuate, but I'm just wondering uh, if that's your current projection. What what risk is there that you won't achieve that? Um, I'm sorry, we're just uh, looking through pieces of paper here. Then. The non-operating or the other operating? Uh, non-operating. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. It's the, uh, it's just the investment impact. Um, so the equity follows, right? Um, always, yeah. Yep. In my eyes, just as a note here, um, I, I noticed that your um, proposal doesn't include any uh, additional revenues from Medicaid. Um, is that because Medicaid is a, uh, you as a hospital are a price taker, or is that because of your enrollment in one care, and now you have kind of a, a fixed Medicaid payment going forward? Uh, so, so, thank you. Other questions, Rob? Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could just speak briefly to um, the retirement community, because I know it, we, that that's been a little bit slower to ramp up than you had been expected when you had previously filed for, your, for the CON, and that seems like that is a, a budget pressure that you're facing. So that's not, um, that is not reflected in the, in the financials for the hospital side. Um, however, obviously, given our discussions um, about that, um, uh, when we discuss the, the, the day's cash on hand, that's the day's cash on hand for our entire organization. So um, uh, as we're ramping that up, as expected, uh, as you are filling uh, a program like that with residents, um, you know, we are uh, relying on our uh, reserves and um, uh, our day's cash on hand to, um, uh, to make up the difference while we're filling that. So. Um, we are um, around where we uh, had targeted we would be at this point in our budget year on that in terms of our residency. We are still in fill-up phase. Um, we are the winters, as um, any of you who have been in Vermont for a while know, real estate doesn't uh, move much in, uh, in the wintertime. Um, so that is, um, that is normal that we're seeing that right now. It's a little slower the last couple months. We're seeing uh, increased activity in terms of people inquiring, in terms of people coming in and taking a look. We have um, 
um, uh, some um, uh, some people who are um, committing to come in the next couple months. Uh, hopefully, it won't be too muddy. Um, but um, uh, despite that, uh, we're looking at that ramping up in the next couple months as well. Again, we still think we've got a uh, a good shot of hitting our um, our occupancy figure, uh, which at the end of the year we were uh, expecting to be at uh, 30, which is about 60% um, uh, of uh, full occupancy uh, there. So we think we've still got a, a, a good shot at that. Um, so we're, uh, you know, we're about where we uh, thought we'd be at this, uh, at this point in the, in, the, in the budget year. Does that, does that answer? Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Jess? Um, so thank you very much. And I appreciate um, a lot of the cost saving efforts that you're already undertaking. And the rate request feels to me like a short term stopgap measure to improve the margin and to help address some of the workforce issues. But I wonder if you could just talk briefly about some comprehensive long range strategic planning that you might be under you know, undergoing to determine honestly which services Gifford can effectively provide at low cost and high quality. Um, you mentioned ortho. One of the things we learned in our ortho panel was that one of the ways to really reduce costs is having economies of scale and leveraging volume to be able to bargain with vendors to get implants, for example, at reasonable prices. So given that Vandoff is an HSA that tends to be in the in the high end of total cost of care. I'm wondering what kind of long range planning you're doing to think about service lines and, and what's appropriate to be doing in Randolph in say five years from now, yeah. three years from now. That also may help the hospital become more sustainable. Yeah, we um, uh, so we do we do have our uh, we do have a strategic plan that um, uh, we adopted um, about a year ago. Um, our our most current um, strategic plan. Um, we're doing a number of different things uh, in relation to our service planning. Uh, one of the things that um, I think um, 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 Kevin Mullen mentioned earlier, our geographical location in regard to the colleges. Um, uh, Randolph is in the, I think it is the center of the state, um, the, ge the geographic center of the state. We're also in between uh, the, the two larger uh, tertiary care hospitals. Um, that works in our advantage in that we're able to work with them to, um, to, to partner on some of the services. For instance, we partner with Dartmouth Hitchcock on cardiology. We partner with them on uh, our orthopedics. Uh, we partner with Central Vermont and UVM uh, on oncology and pathology and other services. So um, we are not in a situation where we're trying to do everything ourselves. But um, we are looking at what core services uh, are appropriate for a uh, small community hospital, for a small community. Um, keeping in mind that um, where we're situated in Vermont um, uh, is uh, amazingly beautiful with all the mountains. But those mountains can make it very difficult for travel as well. Uh, we have a, an older population. We have, um, I, I think, a percentage of our population that um, uh, where transportation is an issue as well. So there's a core of services that we want to be able to uh, provide in our community. Um, so um, we are working with our partners to do that. We're also uh, investigating what uh, is available in terms of telemedicine services. Again, so that our um, people in our community don't have to travel as far, uh, but they're able to access um, uh, more specialized services. Uh, so we are working on those areas uh, as well. Um, we are, uh, you know, I think a big thing uh, for us, and I think probably uh, every hospital would tell you the same thing, um, you know, we, we have been working to get out of the mode of um, just trying to find the next person to come in uh, for any position, but particularly for our uh, physician positions. We're looking for people who have some tie back to our community. Uh, and I would say our community, meaning Vermont uh, in, in whole, uh, people who um, have uh, interests that are in line of what's available um, uh, for their family, for themselves, what they like to do. Um, that approach, uh, I mean, we've seen some success in utilizing that approach. It's a slow approach, um, and we are, uh, this is gonna take us you know, a while. We're not just gonna snap our fingers and have all of our positions filled and have uh, everything humming along at the same levels we've had in the past, it's going to take a little bit of time. 
but we're seeing that um, those uh, successes there, and that's what we're going to continue to do as well. So we are able to fill those positions that we need for those core services in our community, but we're filling them with people who are going to have a long-term connection um, and who are going to stay. We just um, uh, celebrated the retirement of one of our pediatricians who'd been with us for 43 years. Um, uh, that is Ludi Nicola, and uh, you know it's retirement in quotes. He, he's never really going to stop um, being involved. But you're not going to see those people who are staying for 43 years uh, like you did in the past. But we're trying to find people who are going to make that connection, um, who we can get to stay here for 10 years, for 20 years. Um, uh, you know, our our community needs that. They, they demand that, and they deserve that. And uh, that's been our approach. One of the things, Dan, uh, there are only three FQHC hospitals in the country. Two of them are here at Vermont. Uh, one of the things that surprised us in Springfield was the operating losses being experienced by the FQHC side physician practices. What's the financial picture in Gifford on the FQHC uh, practices? Um, improving. We. Um, uh, you know, again, I, I, I would, I would, um, I'd be careful in, I, I, in, for me as one person, I'd be careful in making too close a distinction there uh, with the FQHC um, uh, primary care relationship to the hospital, because most hospitals have primary care. And I think the larger context, the larger conversation is that primary care is incredibly difficult. Um, and if you just look at primary care as a single service, in general, it's not going to be one that is going to um, generate a positive operating margin. Um, but if you don't have primary care, you don't have a healthcare community. And uh, so I, I would just caution to look at it from that uh, standpoint. Um, we have had, um, uh, and I don't, this isn't news to the board, I've talked about it numerous times. I'm sure my, precedent, but my uh, predecessor did as well. Um, we had, like a lot of people, some uh, difficulties of primary care in that we had a number of retirements. We had uh, a number of people who uh, left for other positions. Uh, we had some people who left um, uh, primary care. Uh, and we've been building that back, and we've been seeing that improvement. Uh, we've been seeing our volumes and our revenues increasing. Uh, at the same time, we've been seeing our costs come down because of uh, the efforts we've been making there. So. Uh, we've seen significant improvement over the last couple of years, and we continue to see that this year as well. And uh, I'd say we're doing we're doing uh, we're doing well. When you're out recruiting for a new primary care doc, what's the starting pay? Uh, you really going to make me answer that? <laughs> um, we well, we look at uh, we look at a range. Again, it, depart it, it depends on. I'm going to try to get out of uh, giving you a number. Um, uh, I'm just going to be honest about it. Um, we, we look at a range, and we, uh, we mark that to Medical Group Management Association uh, surveys, MGMA. Um, we mark that to um, uh, you know, what, we are, what we're hearing in the community. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's increasing. I think MGMA says the, uh, the, um, the median for this area, uh, for the eastern area of their survey is um, 215 or 220. Um, we also, we look at FQHCs, uh, which tend to be lower, um, lower than that. Um, but then you look at some of the larger, um, larger hospitals or health systems, and I think they tend to be higher. So we're trying to market in the middle. Um, we're trying to be competitive, but we also know we can't hit that high end. Uh, and our volumes are not going to be what they are in a, a suburban or urban area. Um, so we have to be real, realistic about that. And again, we go back to trying to find people who are, um, who want to be in that kind of community, uh, who want to be um, like um, our physician Ken Bory had uh, talked to the Senate Health and Welfare about. They want to have a situation where they're caring for four or five generations of the same family uh, who want that kind of care. So <laughs> those are the kind of things we're looking for. Uh, we're probably not going to win a lot of the uh, money battles when it comes to uh, compensation, but. Um, we need to be competitive and we need to uh, attract people who uh, want to be in the kind of community and the kind of healthcare organization that we are. And we think the FQHC with a hospital actually is beneficial to a lot of people um, uh, who are looking to work 
um, uh, in primary care. So we do think that that's a, a, a positive thing. Okay, are there other questions? If not, is there a motion? Tom? <coughs> I hadn't thought about this, but I'll make it up as we go along. Um, I move that we um, <coughs> accept the staff recommendation relative to the um, uh, increase in Gifford's NPR. Um, I uh, this is just a question for the chair. It's actually a commercial rate. It's a commercial rate. Commer well, it is a commercial rate, but I know that I'm just wondering. It, it doesn't have anything to do with NPR. It's a decrease in NPR. Uh, uh, well, the, the three components of this thing were the commercial rate increase, the Medicare increase, and a bad debt, and those add up to the 286,000. I, I want to, I want to approve. You know, uh, make a motion that we approve that. Um, but I, um, is it just? Does the motion have to be just simply tied to the commercial rate? I, I believe that uh, really the motion should be to uh, modify the uh, budget order to uh, add the additional uh, one and a quarter to make it a 4% uh, commercial rate increase from the previous year. Okay, then that's my motion. <laughs> Is there a second? I'll second. Is there discussion? I just have a comment I'd like to make before we vote, um, which is that I want to applaud Gifford for taking a proactive approach and actually coming forward to discuss um, some of the issues that they're facing as well as making the, the amendment request. Um, I know that can be a hard thing for hospitals to do, but I, I really think that that openness to have the discussion is incredibly important. Um, and I know that's hard to do in a public forum, but as uh, the regulatory body, uh, it's important for us to have full information about the current financial status, which is also obviously a requirement of the oath that's signed uh, by hospital leadership. Uh, the pressures facing small rural hospitals are obviously not unique to Vermont, and there's been lots of news around closures of critical access hospitals in other areas, and we've been fortunate in not seeing that happen here yet. Uh, but I think we can't be blind to the fact that these are national pressures that Vermont uh, hospitals are seeing, as well as, of course, some, some pressures that are unique to Vermont. Um, as noted by both Jess and Maureen, in terms of uh, what we do in this process around the NPR not being aspirational and the commercial rate being a limited tool, um, I just want to emphasize for myself that I don't think the hospital budget process alone is going to solve all of these pressures because as Maureen said, if the top line is aspirational, you know, that's not going to magically make the revenue come in. And as Jess said, um, our other real tool is the commercial charge, and for hospitals with a patient mix with, that is heavily weighted to Medicare and Medicaid, that's a limited tool. Uh, I personally don't believe we're going to be able to cost shift our way out of uh, financial challenges to small rural hospitals. Uh, Vermonters just don't have the ability to absorb that in the commercial premium area. Uh, and to reinforce uh, a point that Jess made in her question, I think as we move forward, in healthcare reform, um, as we move from volume to value base, that is going to require creativity, forward thinking, and a willingness to really uh, take some operational uh, focus in the long term in order to really shift the, what we're doing in our small hospitals so that it reflects realistic volumes for our very small population as a whole. So thank you for letting me so, Tom, uh, one thing that uh, probably should be added to the motion is effective uh, no earlier than March 18th. I would second that. Okay. Did the seconder agree to that? I agree as well. Okay. Any, any other discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? I want to thank you, Dan. Uh, you know, the communication has been phenomenal between um, you and the, the board, and we appreciate that. And uh, 
uh, look forward to having the, the continued updates. And uh, we wish you the very best in your progress trying to uh, control expenses and uh, maintain a great institution. So thank you very much for everything you're doing. Thank you very much as well. I appreciate the support. Okay, team, let's move on to the next item on the agenda. <laughs> I'll be walking you through Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital and Brattleboro Memorial Hospital's request for um, adjustments to their FY19 budget as a result of provider transfers and acquisitions in their communities. Um, so to kind of provide a framework for this discussion, I want to just read quickly um, language from FY19 budget guidance, Fremont Care Board's budget guidance. Um, when the independent providers move from outside of the hospital system to within, the dollars associated with the provider practice also shift to the hospital. Though these are not new dollars in the overall healthcare system, they can have a substantial impact on the acquiring hospital's budget and NPR and must be appropriately accounted for in the Green Mountain Care Board's review process. So under this provision of uh, budget guidance, both hospitals have requested that their budgets be amended to reflect the acquisition of um, practices that were previously provided by independent providers in the community. So first, and this should all look familiar to the board, um, you've been provided this information previously. So the first is NVRH. They've acquired a physical therapy practice. Um, this practice was independently owned and no longer able to operate in their community when the owner unexpectedly passed away. So the hospital purchased this practice um, effective December 1st of 2018. There are 10 full-time employees comprised of four physical therapists, four physical therapist assistants, and one support staff, and the hospital expects that the level of service is going to maintain from, from when it was an independent practice to a hospital-owned practice. Based on the actual variance for FY17 for each hospital, and the bluish gray bars are the budget to actual variance for FY18. Moving on to outpatient visits, again, same format. Um, the system change budget to actual variance for FY18 was 0.9%, and for your frame of reference, FY17, the variance was a negative 0.8%. With the range of results from a negative 5.2% all the way up to a 52.0% budget to actual variance and the grayish bars, the FY18 variance. So moving on to the second to last section, which is the key financial indicators. We asked hospitals to submit um, lots of financial indicators and we've selected six for this, this presentation. Um, again, all those financial indicators are in the hospital report packages that are located on the website. So um, the three that are displayed on this, we've asked for six. There's three on this slide, one on the next. Base, cash on hand, operating margin, and total margin. And kind of just to ground you in these symbols, um, if there's an arrow pointing up, it means that increasing value, values are favorable. So the bigger the number, the better. Um, if, it's, if it's pointing down, it means the smaller the number, the better. So for example, base, cash on hand, um, there's the column that shows the FY17 results as of September 30th, 2017. So the, these results are specific to a point in time, so it's the last day of the fiscal year. Um, so comparing FY17 results to FY18 results and then the difference between the two. 
So if it's a if it's a number like days cash on hand, those are days. So the 195 days we borrowed in 17, 196 days in 18, and the difference is one day. Um, if it's a percentage like operating margin and total margin, it's the same approach. Um, the percentage in 2017 compared to the 2018 result and the difference between the two. And I just wanted to um, make a correlation on this chart to chart 17. Can you go back to 17 for a second? Yeah, there is a difference in our page numbers because okay. um, this presentation is all four combined. So we're looking for budget to actual for NPR. Yeah, budget to actual, the two year variance. Uh, this is the graphical look. Right, so what I look at, yeah, that graphical look. So if we look at the five hospitals that have missed their budget for the past uh, two years, Grace, Springfield, Gifford, Brattleboro, and Northwestern. And, and then there's a couple others that have missed a bit. Copley, one year, CDMC. Um, and now go to the slide that you were just on. All five of those hospitals for the past two years, their operating margins have been negative. Um, and the other hospitals, the Copley, CDMC, um, they've at least had one year that was a miss to their budget forecast. So um, just trying to correlate again that these misses, when we miss the top line, and some of them are pretty significant, it falls to the operating margin. Um, and when they've had year over year misses from budget, that is gonna be something we'll look at in the budget process again to make sure you know, that we're not gonna run into situations. Those hospitals also tie to some of the ones that are the most financially challenged as well. And kind of following up on Maureen's line, uh, one of the things that uh, is most troubling is when you have uh, huge audit adjustments. And we saw one hospital with over $4 million of uh, audit adjustments. And that comes to us very late. Uh, I don't know if we ever really would be able to resolve those issues um, or catch those issues because we're dealing with information that is given to us. We do not go out and field new audits. And it's just something to throw out there for consideration that um, you know we're going to have to uh, at least consider what could be done differently so that we don't have a situation where uh, days cash on hand could uh, fluctuate so greatly in such a short period of time. Um, the next section deals with five year results, which will show kind of to Marie's point year over year for both operating margin and NPR. Um, this next slide shows the next three categories of financial indicators that we've selected, days payable, days receivable, and debt service coverage ratio. And as Kelly mentioned, there's a glossary in the back that shows the definitions of these, but more specifically, the formulas that the hospitals use to calculate these, these indicators. <coughs> and then five years results. Okay, so this section here, we are providing a multi-year look uh, for the, the budget actual variance by category. Um, well, so um, this is the same format we're going to use on the next two slides. We have the hospitals, again, in alphabetical order. We have actuals from FY14 through FY18 and um, several of the uh, process 
So that's the end of the numbers piece. Um, we have included this um, short two-slide glossary to help readers with definitions and formulas. Um, and we also have, if you're interested in additional definitions and formulas, um, you're welcome to look at our user reporting manual that goes along with the budget guidance on our website. It's very lengthy and exciting. Um, if you're interested in more information about the hospital budgets and how things are calculated within our reports. And that concludes the actual results presentation. Thank you, team. Clearly, when you look at the uh, numbers, um, we have a large number of hospitals uh, that have exceeded the variance that was allowed in, in previous year's guidance. Um, and I think we're scheduled on the 27th, is that correct? Correct. To have a discussion on enforcement, but at some point we will have to uh, have a discussion on, um, as we saw last year, I think, uh, Use two percent um, in our final discussions. Um, the guidance had a half percent. Next year's proposed guidance, although it hasn't been voted on, has that uh, increasing to one percent. So, one of the, the items that we will have to uh, talk about as a board is what percentage of the variance are we going to use for our discussions on the 27th. So, I'm just throwing that out there so that people are thinking about that. Um, as we move forward. I will be presenting all three percentages for you. Perfect. So, next is the hospital website. You know, I guess maybe we probably should just open it up for public comment okay. um, since it's really two different topics right. and rather than putting it all to the end, is there any public <coughs> comment on the actual information camp? Sort of a comment and a question, Mr. Chairman. Um, the questions are, um, I think it's a huge hole here, in, in, in which is all the spending in Dartmouth, which really drives with everything that's happening on the East Coast, and it's really squirrely over there, and that's obvious from what Tom is saying, or Maureen's saying, what Jess is saying. And so um, I'm just curious whether there's something the board can do the, the, uh, it's to fill in this big gap because I don't think you can get, you, can, you can't get something like uh, cost per capita in the service area without knowing what's happening on the tertiary end. That means that blocks you out from that piece of insight on the whole West Coast, I mean East Coast. So I'm just curious why, whether there's any, anything you can do. Um, the, you don't have any legal hold over Dartmouth, but you do have a legal hold over One Care Vermont. And, is an owner of One Care Vermont. So it just seems to me that somebody's got to do something about filling in the picture to, so that you can start to figure out. I can do, I, I, know what, I know what Tom's looking for, and it's obvious what Maureen is saying, it's obvious what Jess is saying. I don't think you're gonna get at any of that unless you can start getting a grip on Dharma. That's just, that was, so that's a question and a comment. Sometimes I think you read my mind, Ian, but. <laughs> It, it has been one of the most frustrating things when you see such a large percentage of our health care costs being exported across state lines and not being able to uh, really uh, weigh in on that. It is troubling. We well, it is, I think it's worth a try, Mr. Chairman. I, I, we agree, obviously, but, but uh, the, uh, the, current chair, the current CEO of One Care Vermont is in fact a Dartmouth person who's highly knowledgeable now, understands not only one care but fully understands New Hampshire, which is also a piece of this. There's a, there's a string of pearls on the east side of the Connecticut River, just as there's a string of pearls on the west side of the Connecticut River. And I just think that that somebody ought to muscle with Dartmouth. Can I just make a point, which is we do actually get the spending data through claims. We don't get the financial metrics from the hospital, but if it's a Vermont resident, then we would have in V-Cures any spending that occurs at Dartmouth. So we do have, because that comes from the, the payers. So obviously there's other holes in V-Cures like the self-insured uh, issue. So we, we're not totally blind, but I think to your larger point, uh, we don't have a regulatory lever, uh, certainly, to require reporting. Uh, we did, I think, last year request 
if, if Dartmouth would voluntarily come in and uh, talk with us uh, about what's going on and what they're doing. And my, my recollection is they declined. <laughs> Well, let me, can I just ask something? Is is that is any of that data the so what you might call indirect or partial data from Dartmouth? Is that in, is that in integrated into any of this analysis? Not in this because this is by hospital, right? But if you look at the, we get other sources of data like in the ACO program, we get the information of on more of a claims basis too. Okay, but then where do where does where does someone anyone? Where does someone get a look at the full analysis of what's going on <laughs> in the system? Sure I, get a lot of, I can figure out the West from, from what I got in my hand. Yeah. But I can't figure out the East worth the hoop. As Robin says, it's really the in the expenditure analysis. But it's one of the frustrating things as we try to <laughs> hold hospitals accountable for um, total cost of care in the health service area. Uh, one of the frequent uh, um, retorts from someone that may be at the high end on uh, total cost of care calculation as we look at the data is that that's because of uh, movement to tertiary hospitals like Dartmouth. And so, uh, you know, we continue to try to evolve and try to get better, but I don't think we've by any means figured this out. Thank you. Thank you Other questions or comments from the public? Okay, let's move on. Guidance. This is going to be an update of the previous presentation on February 20th. We will be going through a summary of those changes. We'll review non-financial reporting guidance that you have approved that we'll be able to ask the hospitals for in April. Uh, mention the public comments we received today, and then the next steps. In the narrative, we have added a change to a appendix, which is going to be asking for hospitals' responses to this particular table. It's an all-payer total cost of care table, and the questions that we'll be asking are on appendix 11. I will show you the appendix in a few minutes. We're asking hospitals to let us know what they think could be improved in our view of the total cost of care and the HSAs. Um, maybe Jess, you could help me out a little bit on this one. Help you out? Okay. Um, so this is uh, a response, I think, when uh, Pat was still here, when the team presented the hospital finance in the first round, I had requested that we move, take a baby step towards trying to start to align the hospital budget process with the all-payer model by pulling together some measures of total cost of care per capita at the HSA level, which I think is what this is the first pass at doing, looking over time at the HSA and looking at uh, absolute level of total cost of care and growth over time. And the point was to start to unpack some of these numbers, recognizing that there's lots of caveats, that there's not a one-to-one -one mapping between the total cost of care in the community and the HSA and the hospital spend, or even hospital services. But how do we, with all the caveats in mind, and I think there's plenty of caveats that were put in the budget guidance around what this data shows and what it doesn't show, and what are the factors that could go into explaining uh, total cost of care, whether it be demographics, whether it be payer mix, whether it be uh, services offered, whether it be out of state spending, all of these types of, types of uh, factors can explain some of these measures. But to the extent that at the end of the day, Vermont is going to be held responsible for this total cost of care per capita at the state level, we need to start to understand what's happening at the HSA level. So the request was to put it in the hospital budget guidance as an appendix, similarly to what we did a couple of years ago when we put the quality measures in and asked the hospitals to respond to what do they see happening in their HSA related to quality that we're being held accountable for. This is the corollary to that to say, these are the total cost of care uh, per capita measures in your HSA. Can you talk to us about it? If your HSA is above the state average, 
help us understand why. If your HSA is growing at greater than 3.5%, which is what we're going to be held accountable for, can you help us understand why? Um, and are there, you know, this is our first pass of trying to understand what's happening um, in HSAs. Is there a better measure? Is there another way to look at this to better align the hospital budget with the all-payer model agreement? So it's an appendix. It's We would love some uh, insights from the hospitals in their HSAs. Is that a helpful explanation? Anybody else want to add that from uh, our conversation from the board a couple weeks ago? This data would include Dartmouth, although, again, because the speakers it excludes uh, self-insured employers. The next changes that we have is under the budget performance enforcement or enforcement. We are changing the language a little bit to go back to the rule where our, um, our, on the paragraph six, we are changing the term rates to charges. We are changing, taking out the uh, subsequent year over years to be years. And we're adding back, allow hospital to retain a percentage of, of all of the surplus funds. And F is any other actions the board deems appropriate. So we're basically changing it back to what the rule was in the budget guidance. Then we've added appendix, like I mentioned, appendix 11, the total cost of care table. We've changed the appendix for asking for a modification to your budget. Basically like what Gifford and Springfield are asking. We've kind of simplified it, made it a little bit more understandable. We changed the terminology about modified budget requests. We're asking them to um, put it into a, like an Excel, a updated full year financial projection for fiscal year 2020 and added the sentence provide information on impact of proposed increases in charge on gross revenues as well as NPR. And the other updates we did, um, they were not available the last time, we've added the oath for the board chair and then we received the questions from HDA, so there we are in the documents now. Any questions on those? Any questions? Okay. Then we have the April non-financial reporting. We hopefully will have your approval today and we will send them out to the hospitals. This is about quality, improvement related to the all pair model, the access time and wait times, and the community health needs assessments. We are asking the hospitals to submit their data by the end of April, and we as sports staff will be summarizing those answers for you so that you'll have them available when the budgets come in in the summer. Do you want to add anything to that? So I do believe that uh, what you're seeking today is board approval for the April reporting templates, and uh, hopefully we can vote on that uh, this morning. So. Thank you. And we wanted to let you know we received public comments from Vaz. Um, the public comments centered around the guiding principles of the boards the narrative requirements and the enforcement policy. The UVM asked for us to take into consideration um, better benchmark for the Academic Medical Center for basically, we're, we're looking at the benchmarks anyway, so we'll be improving them uh, in the future. And then the Office of the Healthcare Advocate was around patient affordability and hospital costs. <coughs> Okay. Then we are asking for your your vote on the non-financial reporting guidance. Um, if you have any more uh, revision revisions to the guidance, and also on the last time when we met, there was a 3.5 percent NPR growth target. 
and the year-over-year -year, um, change that was going to be for 2020 and 2021. So a two-year 3.5% target. And we are asking the board to vote on the guidance finally by March 31st, because we have to, by statute, give them out to the hospitals. Okay. Uh, hopefully we can do that uh, vote on the 27th, since the 31st is not a uh, board date. But if necessary, we'll have a, an additional meeting. Um, I'm going to open it up to public comment before we start to walk through the next steps, just so that we can, um, the board can actually vote on the non-financial um, reporting guidance for April. So at this point, uh, I'll open it up to the public for any public comments or questions. Yes, sir. Association. Um, so, uh, in looking at the new guidance as it's been presented, um, specific to Appendix 11, um, I think that one, you know, directionally, this is the right sort of way to go. I wonder if this is the right place for um, these types of questions. Clearly, the caveats placed in the in the Appendix 11 guidance recognize that this is not completely the hospital. Um, numbers and all of the challenges around capturing the um, pharmacy piece, the self-insured piece, and, and would suggest possibly moving this out of the, um, the current guidance to potentially the ACO budget process and or another um, vehicle. Um, uh, I question the relevance of this information when you'll be making decisions on um, hospital budgets, which are more um, evidence and fact-based than some of this this information. So, um, I appreciate the opportunity to comment. And will be will there be a new comment period um, posted for this? Because this certainly hasn't been discussed with any of our so members. We have the time to uh, have a public comment period, so um, we could post that. Thank you. And um, again, as we we outlined in our comment letter last week, we certainly appreciate all of the dialogue, the communication that's happened between your team, um, the, your staff. Uh, it's been it's been, <coughs> it's been really really great process. So uh, thank you to, to uh, all of you. We likewise want to thank all of that uh, participated. There was a great number and uh, uh, a great dedication to the work, so thank you, Mike. Um, any other public comment? Mark? Mark Stanislaus from the University of Vermont Health Network. Um, I would welcome the opportunity to work with the board and the board staff on what an appropriate benchmark is for an academic medical center. And I just kind of wanted to share where the concern was with putting it that out. Um, my interpretation was Appendix 4 was to give a guide um, um, as a financial health indicator. So my comments are coming from that perspective. And if you look at the 98 days cash on hand there, and if you look at the S&P metrics, that's below a triple B rating. So it is it is triple B minus and below. That's a non-investment grade hospital, or it's considered a junk bond status hospital. So there's a lot of concern there if this benchmark gets put out there, particularly from a day's cash perspective. I, you know, so so I would welcome the opportunity to work with you. I think putting a benchmark out there for an academic medical center that is that is below an investment grade and giving that the appearance that that is a financial health of an organization, meaning an organization that is doing well. Um, I think that's very, very misleading, and I would welcome the opportunity to work with your staff on what a more appropriate benchmark is for an academic medical center. Excellent. Thank you. 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 Th
speaking for myself only, Mark, I totally agree with you, and uh, I'm sure that the staff is more than uh, happy to uh, work with you to try and to figure out what that appropriate benchmark would be. And, and I think this goes to some comments earlier that, you know, not one benchmark fits all, and I think this is one of them. So, likewise, I think well, the critical access hospitals probably deserve their own benchmark, too. Thank you, Mark. Other members of the public? Seeing none, is there a motion by a member of the board on approving the non-financial April reporting guidance? I can move approval of the non-financial reporting guidance to be issued for April. Seconded by member Holmes. Is there any discussion? <coughs> If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. So as noted, we have a, a public comment period. And uh, we will likely be looking to have the actual vote on the revisions to the guidance on March 27th. And uh, is there anything else, team? You know, you're doing incredible work, and uh, you haven't missed a beat, so um, very much appreciate all the efforts that have been put in, and I think uh, the data was very uh, useful to the board, and we look forward to the continuing discussion on, on these issues throughout the rest of the month. So thank you very much. Thank you. getting the actual 2018 results right now and looking at the past two years on the current budget the budget for 19 is up 2.8 percent um, 18 was up 3.1 percent 17 was up 2.8 percent um, looking at all the hospitals over the past two years since we're also looking at a two-year guidance only three of them have exceeded a three point, what would have been a 3.5% cap over those years. So that was Mount Scutney, Northeastern, and UVMC. So, you know, one thing I wanted to talk about is potentially proposing a range, you know, whether that be like two and a half to three and a half, or, or making some, you know, kind of blocking ourselves in for three and a half percent for two years. Um, we haven't needed that for the past two years. We haven't needed that in the budget this year. It's, you know, it's growing the number instead of addressing one of the things that we wanted to do, which is, you know, controlling that number as well. And I understand the 3.5 ties into the total cost of care targets, but those targets include a lot of spending outside of the hospital spending. So I'm just trying to you know, we can only do this in a public forum, we can't talk about it privately, so that's why I'm you know, bringing this up now, but um, you know, whether putting in a range or something to, to give a little more flexibility rather than locking in to one number over the next two years, which is you know, a bit higher than what we've actually trended to. Um, and I know what some of the issues are there are that certain hospitals are not going to hit the three and a half percent. They haven't historically. It would be a challenge for them to get there. And the key lever that they use to get there is the commercial insurance rate. So I do also want to put out there as well, we will once again be looking at the, I certainly will, what the commercial rate increases are that people are submitting. Because if we stick to a three and a half percent, for the hospitals, and we actually had some hospitals last year specifically say, I could have put in a higher number and still been at the three and a half percent. And that's not what we want to use that lever for. You still have to justify that separately. And, you know, the concern is putting out a higher number for hospitals that will not get there 
is, is going to present some issues potentially on on um, where the, where they may go with commercial insurance. On the other side, there have been hospitals that have exceeded that number every year for the past three years, and you know I think that does need to be a consideration as to where they would fall in a given year. So they would trying to be at the higher end of that three and a half. So it's. It's really to get, open up a little more flexibility for the board. So I just wanted to see if any of the other board members have any comments on that. So I, I guess I'll start with the uh, comments. Um, the reason why uh, I had to propose the 3.5% for the next two years is to create some uh, certainty moving forward. Um, for one, but more importantly, to allow hospitals to make the investments that are necessary as we're moving away from fee-for-service to value-based <coughs> medicine. And the time to make those investments is as soon as possible to try to get future savings in the system. And um, the third point for that number is looking at the incredible workforce pressures which have been so well documented and they're such a daunting challenge for our hospitals and medical uh, professionals throughout the state. And so I, I don't think I ever viewed 3.5 as telling everybody to come in at 3.5 and um, I'm not sure if a range of 2.5 to 3.5 does anything different than just setting it at the 3.5 um, because I think that we're going to have to be realistic on those hospitals, especially that have a trend moving that shows a uh, uh, negative uh, NPR trend. That's going to have to be addressed, and we're going to probably have to do that in enforcement, which will be coming up uh, shortly as well. So uh, at least for me, uh, I'm comfortable sticking with what um, had originally been proposed by me, so obviously I should be comfortable. I can understand some resistance um, to the 3.5 over the next two years. Um, I am uh, comfortable, and I think it's a good thing uh, just for um, people to be able to look down the road to have a two-year target. Um, but I, uh, there's some things I worry about that in terms of the all-payer model, you know, we're, here we are in, in 2019, which is the second year of a five-year run uh, towards the 2022 end. And um, if you look at these, for example, these uh, operating expenses and NPR for the five-year results, um, the averages for both of those um, across the entire system uh, for the five-year trend is 3.8% for NPR and 4% for operating expenses. What I worry about is that we make a mistake um, and get too uh, uh, too far away from our 3.5 percent target, um, and that that it, and we find ourselves in 2021 and 2022 not being able to uh, rein it back in. So, um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of moving parts there, um, uh, but I. I uh, I would feel more comfortable with a range. Maybe it doesn't go as low as 2.5 percent, but um, you know, in the 2.7 to 3.5 percent range, and, and to have, have the board have some discretion. Um, we, we don't have real visibility on the 2019 uh, now, um, as we only have a, a few months or a couple months, two or three months worth of data. But by the time we're into the budget process, we will have. Uh, seven or eight months um, of, of data on 2019, which will help inform our conversation. And so, um, you know, I'd like to get to that point um, before kind of locking in on a, a, you know, a three and a half compounded over two year uh, target um, and maintain some flexibility in the system so that we can adjust. Uh, we have a long term goal here of a total cost of care of three, uh, three and a half percent statewide. And um, we're still in the first half of that uh, uh, that season, and um, um, I think to kind of lock ourselves in uh, with the uh, um, <coughs> risk that um, if some of the bigger players, and as I noted earlier, the uh, the network players are 60% of the pie. Um, if, if 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 things uh, kind of 
pick up momentum that we can't um, pull back, then we wouldn't. We, it risks success for the all parent model, I think. So, in looking at the actual budget guidance language, um, what it currently says is that the board established a X percent growth target for hospital NPR and fixed perspective payment. I think if we said established a maximum X percent growth target, that kind of addresses the issue. Because I think, at least for me, uh, I'm good with the 3.5. I think it gives room to address some of the workforce challenges and uh, investing in larger, more aggressive operational shifts um, that I wouldn't expect, quite frankly, to see this budget cycle, but because that would be a longer term planning project. But I think it has to, the planning has to start now, um, given what we're seeing in, in the financial results, um, where, quite frankly, the growth is modest which is, I think, as a system, what we're looking for. But we are seeing, to your point, Maureen, expenses going up much faster than revenue. And I don't really think the way to deal with that is to increase the revenue, because then we're right into our same affordability crisis. Um, but I think that, so I do think, I agree with Kevin, the 3.5 is a maximum, and, it, and it's not a guarantee. And to your point, Maureen, uh, the guidance then goes on to say that hospitals need to consider their 18 and 19 results and that we would expect that their request would be aligned with those results. So I think we, we might be able to clarify the language in such a way that kind of gets to what Maureen and Tom are, are talking about in terms of ensuring that there's, uh, that we're not continuing sort of aspirational budgets and that there's some reality there. So just a thought. Yeah, and just one comment. The, the, it, it aligns to the 18 or 19 if you're falling below, yes. not yeah. if you're exceeding. That's true. And I, I do agree that um, you know one of the ways that we have been enforcing overages over the past couple years, there's really been two tools that I think we've been using. One is uh, limiting commercial rate increases the next year to kind of offset um, positive margins from uh, growth over the approved budget, or um, adjusting then the NPR growth in some other way uh, the next year. So I guess I'll just echo some of the comments that I've heard already, which I think is that I think we can tweak that language to, sh to address the fact that I think it's an upper limit, it's a maximum. Um, but for the reasons that have already been outlined, I think that you know there are operational investments that have to be made to switch from feeding service to all pair, there's workforce shortage issues. I think that we want to give some headroom, but I think I do hear what you're saying, Maureen, in the sense that we don't want to be seeing aspirational budgets. There are some hospitals that are not going to hit the three and a half. We don't so saying that that's the maximum does not mean that we expect every single hospital to come in at three point five. If it doesn't make sense. And so my hope going forward, and I think that there is that language about looking at their actual performance and a, and submitting a budget that's realistic and not aspirational. I think we really need that. <laughs> and we're gonna be looking hard at that when we see the budgets. And I also agree with your point, Maureen, about uh, commercial rates. So we are gonna be looking at commercial rates and they may come in under 3.5, but if they're asking for a commercial rate increase, that seems out of line um, with medical inflation and other sorts of uh, measures, then I think we're gonna be looking at that. So. To your point about the two-year, one of the things that I think I would say, although I'm not sure this is actually in the budget guidance, but in my mind, if a hospital comes in over in one year, the hope would be that they might adjust if that's possible in the second year. So 3.5, if they exceed in one year, we may be looking more carefully in the second year. Um, and it may not be a 3.5 in the second year. We have to look at all of that. So I think maybe I think, is it possible we could be tweaking some of that language in there to give the board some flexibility that Maureen I think if we put the maximum in there, uh, maximum 3.5, I could live with that. So I can, not really hearing that people are looking for the range. So, so uh, just to be a voice of caution, um, having a concrete maximum could place us uh, at odds with what we've always told hospitals to come to us with your individual story. We've already had two hospitals um, communicate with us about uh, a huge increase um, 
in volume um, over the last few months. It's been a tough winter in Vermont. Um, and more importantly, we've always sent the message that if you can explain to us that you're bringing in business from outside the state, bringing it back into the borders of the state, you can document that, that we would be willing to uh, consider that change. And so I, I just worry about what the language might say when you just say maximum. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with everyone's concern. Obviously, everyone wants to um, try to keep uh, growth um, in mind. I just want to be careful that we don't make a mistake as we try to figure out language to uh, put in. Well, maybe Mike and I can put our heads together and try to come up with something that uh, kind of represents in that paragraph about the percentage, because I think we could also add some language, you know, indicating that, of course, we would take into consideration individual circumstances. Yep. Um, and so any hospitals requested something over the 3.5, that would justify or something like that. I think with those Just tweets, maybe that. we can find language that everybody can work with. Yeah, and maybe Mike and I can try and do that. It, maybe it makes sense since we have a, another week for public comment and we could get that at least a draft posted so that folks could have a chance to look at <coughs> the comment period closes. Thank you, Robin. Are there other comments from the uh, board? Any other points of discussion? Is there any comment from the public? Yeah. Um, Try not to be negative here, but I think that you're pushing on a string with the 3.5. It's uh, you have to do it, and it's, it's worked pretty well so far. But the reality is, I think you're not going to be able to get get the whole thing operating in a sustainable way until you deal with the question of service mix across the whole system, and and you're going to uh, you're not going to be able to do that without getting to be able being able to see start seeing. Uh, uh, cost per capita numbers in the service areas. That's, you, you're, that's really the, the uh, new reimbursement side of system-wide data. And so unless you can, until you do that, until you can see what the cost per capita in each service area is, you're not gonna really know what to do in, in, in your, I know that you're working on that. I mean, I know that you're- Well, we have been actually seeing it. I think uh, one of the slides that you threw up had, um, had some data. The question is, uh, is the data completely reliable? Are there uh, reasons that a hospital can't control the expenses in their service area, things like that? So it gets, it gets tricky because no one would rather move more quickly to uh, a per member per year or per member month basis for this type of uh, discussion that we're having as far as guidance more than me, because I think that's really the key question. With the, question the, the reality is that the, your, on your scale target, your deadline, as Robin has made clear many times, yep. is 2022. You're now putting together, what's going together now is the, is the uh, 2020 budgets. You can't get that into that, you can't really get at it in this budget. So then you're looking at the first look where you could really begin to utilize PM, PM, regulation, financing, whatever, will be 2021. And, that's, and that budget will start to go into, start being put together in really just 12 months from right now. And, and then that, that only gives you one year after that to hit the federal target on the all-payer model deal with the with CMMI. All I'm just saying is that yep. I think it's absolutely, you really just don't understand what's going on in the system until you understand what it's costing per capita and, and we, we have been looking at that, Pam, and I can tell you that we believe that we are in line with um, meeting the goals of the all pair model agreement based on the data that we have as far as the calculations. Other questions or comments from the public? If not, we're gonna recess till one o'clock. Again, thank you, team.
So we're going to resume the, uh, the meeting that was in recess. And uh, whenever uh, Mike and the team from Vital are ready, we can take it away. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I, I apologize. My name is uh, Mike. I have to look up before my name. My name is uh, Mike Smith. I'm the interim president and CEO of Vital. I apologize at the outset. I have uh, contracted a cold that I haven't seen the lights of since the last time I used to work in Montpelier. Um, so I may cough during, uh, during this uh, presentation, and I apologize at the outset. Uh, to my right, um, I'll let people introduce themselves. Uh, Carolyn Stone, Director of Operations for Vital. I'm Andrea Delabrier, Director of Client Services. Hi, I'm Frank Harris, Strategic Technology Advisor for Vital. I'm Bob Chernow, CFO for Vital. First of all, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to give this quarterly update on Vital. And sort of, um, you know, we were here about a year ago, and what a difference a year makes. Um, you know, we still have a lot of challenges uh, ahead of us, but where we were compared to last year is markedly different. But Vital has established a strategic plan. We developed ways to provide, to make it easier for providers to access the VHI. We have implemented a technology roadmap, and in conjunction with the HI Steering Committee, we have established connectivity criteria. And also, we've sort of stabilized our financial operations, as, as Bob will talk about. We finalized the FY20 financial audit in what seemingly was record time, and significantly reduced our budget going forward to the tune of reducing it about a million dollars over the last two fiscal years, and will reduce it another 500,000 uh, in-state funding in 2020. But there's, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time, because there's, we haven't really spent um, a lot of time talking about some of the organizational and governance changes that have occurred at Vital, and I think that is sort of important just to give you an update of what is going on in those areas as well as I get to my uh, notes here. Like I said, we stabilized operations. We are in the process of reestablishing credibility, and our focus in 2019 is to look at the future and talk about sustainability, and we started having those discussions at the board level as well, at our board level as well as uh, in other forums. One of the things that you'll notice about Vital um, in, that's different in the past than it is today is we've really flattened the organizational structure. We've basis, basically taken out the C-suite of, uh, of our structure, well, with the exception of Bob, uh, the CFO, but we've basically taken out the C-suite of our structure, we've basically taken out the vice presidential sort of structure and really flattened the organization so that the directors, the ones that you see here and our new director of technology, Christopher Shank, who's in the audience, they're reporting directly to the CEO. And I think that's important for a, an organization of our size and sort of the nimbleness of an organization to be able to be structured like that. We have new board members that we've added to the board. Uh, Susan Basile, many of you know, um, who was the head of Eva at one time. Mary Beth Eldridge is the representative from Dartmouth. We never had a representative from Dartmouth on our board. We now do. Tom Evslin, who uh, was the chief technology officer for the state of Vermont, at one point, Leah Fuller from UVM, Kelly Lang from Blue Cross Blue Shield, and uh, Vicki Lohner from OneCare. Not only did we want to add new members and new perspective to the board, we also wanted to diversify our board in terms of what we were doing and where we were going. We redesigned our committee structure of the board to include uh, four standing committees, the Executive Finance, the Audit, and Technology Committee, and we have been started to reach out to other health care organizations to see how we can collaborate. One of the things that um, sort of was the vision back in, in, 
you know, it, it sounds like you sometimes now, but 2008, 2007 is how do we bring all these sort of organizations that we created together in order to collaborate and, and move forward? And we're starting to do that, and especially with technology. And um, Frank will discuss a, a, what I think is a very exciting project as we put it in place. And the state HIT plan is in place and is guiding um, uh, our decision making as we move forward. So a lot has happened in a year and a lot is happening now. And I want to sort of, um, if there isn't any questions, I'll take questions, but if there isn't any questions, move to the technology update because I kind of find this exciting. I, I want to bring the board up to speed what's going on. Uh, so as Mike said, uh, I get I get the pleasure of telling you about an effort that we're really excited about, and um, it's a uh, joint effort to share components of uh, health information tech, uh, exchange technology. And the participants in the effort, of course, are Diva, um, the Capital Health Associates, and I think you're probably familiar with them. They're sort of a contractor role for the Blueprint for Health, and the folks in the Blueprint for Health are participating. Uh, One Care Vermont. Uh, vital uh, on behalf of the Beehive and um, Health InfoNet. And Health InfoNet is the main health information exchange. And the focus of the program is uh, on several things. Um, one is um, on interfacing technology, and that, that part uh, really involves the interface engine technology that Vital has used for a number of years, Rhapsody. Uh, and, and in the uh, area of interfacing technology, um, something called the eClinical Works Hub, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, uh, patient matching technology, uh, master patient index, and, and you're familiar that we're looking to improve patient matching uh, in the VI and in the whole ecosystem involving all the groups that I talked about. Um, and also terminology services to standardize terminology across um, healthcare data from different sources. Next slide. So what are the objectives? Um, the first one is uh, best-in-class patient matching synchronized across the architecture. So, so uh, really bringing some technology to bear to uh, make significant improvement in patient matching that you've heard so much about. Um, improved terminology services capability. And um, in the area of terminology services, you sort of, you, it's, a, it's a long journey with a lot of terminology and a lot of data out there. And so the implementation scope initially will be guided by the state and the accountable care organization priorities. And then improved interfacing capabilities I mentioned. And there's um, a, uh, several areas that we're looking uh, to improve there. One is around support um, for direct web services. And what that means is uh, it, it allows us to support uh, the version three standard of HL7, which is the biggest standard for healthcare uh, interfacing and healthcare data exchange. Uh, it allows us to support that standard directly, which we can't do today. And then it gives us a lighter implementation method for implementing interfaces with uh, healthcare organizations. And, this is versus um, what is used today as a virtual private network technology. And for small healthcare organizations, it can be difficult to implement uh, virtual private networks. And so this um, opens up the capability more. And then, as I mentioned, um, something called the eClinical Works Hub. eClinical Works is an electronic health record that's used by a number of practices around the state. Uh, we, we make the count out to be 33 practices. And in order to be able to receive clinical data from those practices, you've got to have an eClinical Works Hub. And, and so uh, we want to add that capability. And then Capital Health Associates, it, on behalf of the Blueprint, uh, needs to get a development capability for interfacing. And so we expect, as part of the program, that, uh, that we will add that capability. And then finally, um, we, we uh, want to put in place with the interface technology a, a method of supporting sensitive data, for example, part two data, um, to be routed to the places where it's appropriate to, to route that data. And to do that in a way that's safe and protected and that the, the customers of the solution, particularly the healthcare organizations sending the data, can understand it and trust it and be, and be assured that their data is going to be appropriately protected. Uh, 
so uh, that's um, an exciting effort for us, and, and I think the thing to emphasize is that not only is it more efficient from a cost perspective, but the outcome is better. I mean, you can just imagine having multiple patient uh, indexes is kind of an oxymoron. You really want to be, uh, you know, have the same source of truth for who the patients are. Um, same thing for uh, terminology. So it's a great step forward for us. Um, I want to mention the future platform study that I, I uh, have spoken with you about in the past, um, and we're continuing our efforts on this. Um, we've, you know, we've focused more on the shared technology program recently, so it's sort of slowed this effort a little bit, and we want to make sure that we understand what we're doing in that program uh, before we make decisions about what our future platform is going to be. Um, and uh, we uh, have released a request for information, uh, and uh, we have developed evaluation criteria for scoring that. Um, we uh, considered 35 vendors um, in, uh, to receive the request for information and decided on 14 uh, that we thought matched the capabilities we were looking for. Um, four of those vendors withdrew. Um, they withdrew because they didn't think that they could meet the capabilities that we were looking for and 10 responses were received. And so the team is currently reviewing the responses and scoring those. And the reason that we want to make sure we get out ahead of this with the shared technology program is because our approach is to ensure that the future platform that we choose fits with the shared technology choices. So the MPI, the terminology services, and the interfacing all need to work with that platform. And so, and we feel confident that we can make the right choices to ensure that that happens. Any questions on what I just covered? No? Good. Thank you. I wanted to come back and spend a little bit of time. I've got 10 and a half months before um, I depart Vital. And one of the priorities for me, at least, what it has been from day one is data cleanup. Our focus in 2018 and 2019, as you can see with what we've been showing you, has been cleaning up data as it comes in through the front door of our databases, of, uh, of the databases of the vendor, databases that we have as well, with an external API and also terminology services, what we just showed you, shared services. And at the point of origin, which is the connectivity require, uh, the criteria that we established with the HIE steering committee. But it can't end there. Um, I think in 2019, there needs to be more focus dedicated to cleaning up the data that's already in the existing uh, database. Um, one of the things I think as we look at 2019, we, we've got some legacy, um, I wanted to say uh, legacy records, but legacy junk in our databases that we really need to clean up. This is mostly data that is accumulated over the years of uh, incomplete records that have uh, insufficient data in them and they're never gonna match to another record. So they're called phantom records. Um, and these records are inflating our unique patient count um, as, we, as we look at our database. And so, we asked our, our vendor HCI or Logisti to perform a third party audit of our database, which resulted in identifying about 3.1 million records uh, in, that, in their database, in that database. However, we strongly believe, looking at that number, that this record is inflated because of those what are called phantom records. We've begun the process of cleaning up those phantom records, and we expect that by the end of the year, um, and certainly before I leave, um, that number is going to be considerably lower than 3.1. So we've had successes in setting the mechanism. We've had successes in uh, deduping. So we've had successes, but we've also had a setback in patient matching that I want to, I want to talk about. In June, we identified 598,000 records in the Medicity database. And by the end of December, we had reduced that number to 236. However, in February, we discovered that our, our vendor had inadvertently turned off a key matching rule, which resulted in wiping out any more and any progress we had made. 
Um, we have corrected this and redeployed the matching tool, plus we have begun to once again run the tools to reduce the duplicate records. We expect to be at 189,000 by the end of December. That's a 20% reduction over the 236 that we ended the year with, um, the previous year with, but we are redoing some of the work that we had already done. We, with, here's where I think we'll be at the end of the year. Matter of fact, this, I'm pretty sure this is where we'll be at the end of the year. With the data cleanup effort, the database cleanup efforts that we're doing and get, we're getting rid of the phantom records, and with the reduction of the duplicates to the number of 189, like I talked about, we're anticipating that our duplicate records will be only below 20% of the total unique patient records. Um, when I look around the country, in terms of the HIEs, that's sort of the bogey that everybody's trying to hit. We're trying to get zero, and eventually we will bring that number even down further. I can say that because I won't be here, so leave somebody else that will be responsible for that. But um, our, our goal is to bring that as close to zero as possible, but the, realistically, um, with an HIE, with all information coming in from different um, parts of the, the state, um, there will be duplicate records. Um, whether they will be as high as under 20% or lower, we'll, we'll see as, as we move forward. We don't anticipate this uh, having to do this again because we're going to implement the MPI, which will give us a look-see into those duplicate records as we move forward, and we won't have to rely on a uh, third-party vendor um, in this sense, in a third-party database, in order to uh, to have a look-see into where we're going and how we're doing it. But I wanted to spend some time because I think database cleanup is something that is ongoing, something that I think is important as we move forward, is a priority of mine uh, before I leave here um, uh, next February. So I wanted to give you an update of what we're doing. Finances. As Mike has said, a, a lot has gone on in the past year, and a lot of good things have happened um, in terms of Vital's performance financially. And um, I'm glad to be able to spend uh, some part of this afternoon to discuss that with you. This chart shows Vital's revenue by year for the periods FY17 through FY19, along with our latest results through the end of January, which is the seventh month of our fiscal year. The takeaways here are, one, uh, Vital completed in the first half of the year, 100% of its deliverables. And this, these were associated with, if we could call it the stub of the amended FY18 contracts, which ran from July 1st through December 31st. Um, we have now begun um, work on CY19. That was negotiated in November uh, 2018. And that contract is unique for us because it runs from January 1st, 2019 through December 31st, 2019. I'd also like to mention that our FY18 audit was completed in 2018 in December. Um, that, in our last review, had been an open item. It was completed with no material weaknesses or significant findings. Uh, moving on to revenue, um, revenue year-to-date is 58% of the budget. So essentially, we are on budget for um, our FY19 plan. Um, we believe that we will close out the year with $6 million worth of revenue on budget. Um, during the first half of FY19, um, our operations team did a fantastic job by completing 61 interfaces and remediating, 
remediated eight more. We still have 44 in interfaces left to go to complete FY19. For comparison purposes, last year we completed 101 um, interfaces for the year. So this year we will be about the same, um, if not a little bit more, in terms of completion of interfaces. Next slide, please. With regard to vital expenses, uh, the takeaways um, from this chart are that one, our current overall expenses are 51% of total FY19 budgeted expenses. So we're slightly below plan for where we thought we would be in this budget year. Uh, we expect that the pace of our spending will pick up in the second half of this year as new technology projects get underway and new hires are onboarded. We expect to be at full headcount um, in terms of our budgeted headcount by the end of the year. Speaking of personnel expenses, they make up 54% of our budget. They are the largest um, portion of um, our expenses. Uh, currently, our personnel expenses represent 56% of the budget, so they're slightly lower than planned. Um, we expect that our personnel cost by the end of the year will be 5% lower than planned, and that's due to some vacancies in administration and the technology teams. However, the reduced personnel costs are offset by additional costs that VITAL had to uh, undertake to engage consultants and temporary hires to fill some of those um, vacancies. We are currently evaluating our material spend and may see cost saving opportunities realized. One example of this is as Mike and uh, Frank spoke about is the partnership amongst um, Vital, Blueprint, uh, and the ACO to work together towards a common MPI improvement project. This should yield savings due to the shared expense of this project. Next slide. Finally, to close, um, looking at our balance sheet, um, it is, it is strong at this point. Our cash on hand is a robust 2.6 million, and this equates to over 180 days. Um, for those of you who were around in November 2016, uh, that number was significantly lower. Um, we expect that our cash flow for the remaining months of FY19 will tighten for two reasons. Uh, the projected increased spending in our tech projects, and also that the revenue from our CY19 contract is lower than it was in FY18 by about $500,000. So those two things um, in concert will uh, affect our cash flow. We do expect that we will have a positive cash flow at the end of the year, um, but it's important to note that as we go into the new year, um, while we're bringing a balance, we believe um, it's important for us to um, have this surplus cash on hand because it is there to sustain us in this period of reduced funding as we go into 2020. We've been cutting costs um, throughout this year in order to prepare for um, this more austere funding environment. So this concludes my presentation regarding our finances. Um, are there any questions that I can address? I just had a question on both the revenue and expenses for 18. Um, how does that compare to what your forecast was? You know, as I recall, I think you gave it a little bit favorable maybe in total? Yeah, um, we, we were favorable. Um, our revenue was basically on target. Um, but our expenses were 
uh, significantly reduced from what they were um, budgeted for FY18, and that was due to uh, delays that we had um, in some technology programs. Um, I just want to expand on that a little bit. We are building cash, and the reason we're building cash is for money. And I think I did, we talked about before that we'll probably have an operating deficit in 2020. I'll rely on the cash to close that operating deficit in 2020. In 2021, we, we hope to have revenue and uh, expenditures of, uh, match up. But in 2020, we just wanted to make sure it gave us some time in order to do that. of the time uh, that we were allotted and try to stay, and we're over it by seven minutes, by the way, but, um, but we want to be cognizant of the time and stay to the schedule. Um, so there's a, we'll take any questions. There's a lot of slides in the back, sort of performance slides on, on the various things, and take any questions that you may have. Okay, I've got questions before. Uh, can you go to the station providing consent slide and just talk a little bit about Yes, where you thought you were going to end the year, and it looks like we're trying to move a little bit behind there. Now let me get to that slide. Is this the one? Yes. Yeah, our goal actually is 42%. Um, I think our goal in um, in 2018 was 38% or there about 35, 35%. We were over our goal in uh, 2018. Our goal is 42%. Um, there are, we expect to be at the 42% level. We may, this may show it a little behind, but there are several encouraging things that I just wanted to bring to the board's attention on this, anticipating this question that um, I would be asked on this. Um, we have gone live since the last time. As you remember, we had the University of Vermont Medical Center, which contributed a lot to um, bring it up from 19 to uh, the 38. 99% we have now. The uh, Southwest, Southwest um, Vermont Medical Center has uh, come on live with electronic consent. Electronic consent projects in the progress after uh, EHR upgrades will be Northeastern, uh, North Country, Northwestern, UVM Health Network, uh, C, Central Vermont, and then Porter. Well, we have found that with their EHR right now, um, is sort of not capable of providing the electronic consent. Brattleboro, Mel Stepney, and Grace Cottage, and we're still investigating sort of the um, the, tech, the technical aspect of Copley Hospital and Gifford. And on hold right now is Springfield and Rutland Regional because they have the Rutland Regional Springfield because we've read about it, and Rutland Regional because of competing priorities. So we're starting to move in that. I think you'll see the. I think you'll see um, us get the goal of 42% um, this year easily. Can you ever accomplish the goals of the division for vital with a less than a 50% uh, threshold? Is it even possible under the current consent policy to become a success? Yeah, that's, um, in my opinion, no. Um, that's going to be a challenge. You can. I think the question that I would say is, do you want to be fully operational in an efficient and effective manner? And I always want to be operational in an effective and efficient manner. And an opt-out consent allows us to do that. If you want to, if you want to continue to have sort of a drag on your ability to be as efficient as possible, and let, let me just uh, explain why this is so important. When you're a provider, you don't have a lot of time. Um, and we found that the, the consent policy isn't working, hasn't worked um, since we've implemented it back in the, the 2000s. But when, we, when you're a provider, you don't have a lot of time. When you go in to see, when you go in to check the patient's record, either through within your own EHR, as, um, as we are more apt to do as we go on to these cross-community access, like at UVM that just went live, but if you, 
If you go in there, you're expecting to see your patient. If you go in there and six times out of 10, you can't see your patient, that sort of bounces it out of the workflow. And, and so it's not an effective way to sort of incorporate into the workflow. I will say this, I've been here a year, so I guess I'm an expert. Um, but we have a very good, uh, Vital is very good at, at doing what it does. Um, and we're comparable to some of the death run HIEs that are out there, whether it's Maine technology, we have the same technology, whether it's Delaware, we sort of have the same workflow as Delaware, whether it's Colorado. What we don't have that some of those other states have is a consent policy that allows us to be fully operational. And, and I'm convinced that's because we aren't in the workflow as efficiently as we should be within the, at the provider network, whether it's a hospital, whether it's a practice. So if you're asking me, do I believe that consent is needed in this state in order to fully operationalize the HIE? Absolutely. Who loses when a doctor can't access a patient's records? Well, in my mind, there's two losers. I mean, the provider loses because they don't get a full record of what the, the, the individual uh, may or may not have. But number two, I think the patient loses because they kind of expect the doctor to have the information in front of them. Um, now, we can talk about, and I think this is important, if we're gonna move to an opt-out in this state, which I, I believe fully, I believe that in, in 2006, I believe it now, if we're gonna move to an opt-out, I, I do think there's an implementation period that we sort of have to bring people up to speed, we just can't, and, and we've gotta have that collaborative process as we, as we move forward, but I think it's, I think it's important that we tackle this issue sooner rather than later um, in order to, you've got all the elements of a, of a working, um, of a very efficient HIE. You've got the HIE steering committee now, you've got the plan, you've got a vital that's on its way. Um, there's one component that we're just lagging behind and that's the consent policy. Other questions from board Tom? Is there any relationship uh, in terms of the percent of Vermont patients providing consent, uh, that statistic and the diminishment of the duplicate records, i.e. is if you diminish, continue on your path of reducing duplicate records, does that have an effect on your uh, percent of patients providing consent? It could, but we didn't see that much of a fluctuation, maybe because uh, our vendor was adding duplicates um, as we were reducing them. But um, we didn't see that much of a fluctuation. It could in, in that regard, and it would make that number harder to get. But yeah, I you could see that. Um, I'm not expecting a huge amount of change, but you could see that. Any other questions from the board? If not, we'll open it up to the public for comment or questions. Eric. Sure. My name is Eric Schultes with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. So I just wanted to follow up on a question you asked Chair Mullen about who loses, um, you know, when you can't see the records. Who loses when there are multiple, when there are duplicates in the system? So like even if you could access it and you have a 20% duplicate rate, how trustworthy can like the patients and providers feel that they're getting the accurate information that they need. You know, you want me to answer that? Sure. That's a good question. That's why I think we have focused on the data cleanup and the reduction of the duplicates as you move forward. You know, from from the the, the challenge with duplicate records is that we don't see the patient, we just get the information that's coming in, so we can't query what the patient is, so we're putting things in place to reduce it. Who loses is it wastes the time of the provider. That's who loses. Um, and we're recognizing that as a loss for the provider because he's gotta wade through those. He or she has to wade through those to uh, make sure that the duplicates are, are there. You know, I think, 
we are on the process now of doing things that other people aren't doing. They're looking, we're looking very, very extensively at our, our data and making sure that it's clean. There's a lot of databases out there that aren't doing the same thing. But if, to answer your question specifically, I think the provider loses because, and in the, in the end, the patient loses because if they're duplicate, first of all, six times out of 10, they're not gonna be able to see whether there's duplicates. But second of all, I think if they can see it and there are duplicates in there, it's uh, the provider takes more time to go through that. And secondly, um, you know, they may become discouraged, and we've just got to clean that up. Okay, other questions or comments from the public? Yes. I was at my uh, primary care provider yesterday, and I don't know if they're hooked into Vital or not, or however, but I was made a reference to what happened to me 12 years ago, and they were on the computer and on the data, and they couldn't find it scrolled through, they couldn't find it, so I had to explain what, you know, explain it all. So I don't know if that's part of this, but it was an interesting thing, because, you know, the computer backed up, locked up, and then we had to reboot the thing, and on and on like that. It took about a half an hour before she couldn't find it. <laughs> so I don't know if that, it was up in the Lamoille County area, so I don't know if you deal with that or not. But. Yeah, let, let's talk afterwards. Let's find out who the provider is. We can see whether they're on or not. And let's find out a little. Oh, I know who the <laughs> Yeah, yeah it, I just don't yeah. know. Other questions or comments from the public? Dale. Follow up to his uh, in general. Um, how long do you hang on to patient data? Uh, connect to patient records. And isn't there a law around how long the data must be held, somewhere around 10 years, or is it less? Well, I know that we have not gotten rid of any data that we have uh, had accumulated, and that's, that it, it causes two problems. Some of those, that data in there is just one field, and you know, that causes those kind of records sort of, sort of situations. The second of all, I may come to the board at some point and talk about reducing the number of years that we have for records. We have to have an engagement with the provider community and to some extent um, the, the patient community on what that's gonna look like. But right now we've got a lot of data on a lot of Vermonters um, but that isn't accessible. <coughs> to their providers. That gets into an issue that I'm familiar with too, which is in the old days, you may have file folders because you didn't have computer systems and if, if you're a child growing up with healthcare issues, but when you get to the age of 18, you had two or three files which was as much as some people would have their whole lot. <coughs> that issue existed even then. What did you do? How long did you hang on to the data? What was relevant from birth as far as healthcare information that must always stay with a person throughout their entire life? It is extremely frustrating because I now have had this happen, where I will walk in, and it looks like I'm no more than eight years old. When I ask them, what about these significant healthcare events that occurred in my life? Where did they go? Well, in their records, not only did they not exist, I don't exist. It, it gets a little, strange that way as far as you're, you're <laughs> sitting there you're 58 years old and there's nothing that shows you grew up there's nothing that shows anything beyond eight years that I think will be a problem going forward I don't know how everybody deals with that 
you can end up with those questions where it's like, how many surgeries have you had in your life? You, if you list six, they might only have records for two. And what kind of medical errors, what kind of bad judgments can come up, issues like that? I, I think this will become a very important issue for a certain percent of the population. Do you want to tackle that at all? Well, where, where we strive for is a complete medical record. I mean, that's our, that's what we strive for is the complete medical record. To sort of go back and answer your question, HIPAA requires us to keep it seven years. We haven't gotten rid of any data, um, but at some point I may come back to the board and talk about that issue um, before I leave. So, um, you know, on an individual basis, uh, I can't speak to the individual aspect of it because of the, the privacy concerns and nor do I know. But um, on a on a global basis, we're looking for the the doctor or the provider to have a complete medical record that is up to date so that they can look at it um, and find out what are the pertinent aspects of that complete medical record. That's our goal. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the public? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry for all the pop drop papers here. <laughs> Demonstrates uh, what's possible in government. And, uh, thank you, Michael. And we're going to miss you in your current role, but we're also going to welcome you in your your new role. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Michael Costa from Diva, and I'm so grateful for your kind words. I've had it's been such a pleasure to serve in state government for the last uh, nine years in Vermont. Um, although I have less hair, I have more appreciation for everybody. We should still uh, have hair. <laughs> And, and I think the one theme that runs right through all that work is I just really like typical problems. I'm grateful Vermont's a place where people will help you with those problems. Um, and so I'm grateful to be attacking healthcare reform from a different angle uh, at Northern County's level here at St. John's. <coughs> and I have this strange feeling that HIE will be part of that discussion too, uh, as I learn more about how practitioners do their work every day. Uh, today we're offering the board of I'm here with Emily Richards, our HIE lead, uh, just sort of a run of the mill update, uh, and I think that's really important. Um, we spent a lot of 2017 and 2018 trying to get this program out of the ditch and back on track, and had to ask ourselves questions like, what does it mean for the HIE program to be back on track? What does success look like? Uh, how do we go from putting, answering ad hoc legislative questions to having standard work that we do? Um, and so I'm really grateful to be sitting here with Emily after the work that she and her team and Mike and his team at Vital and the HIE steering committee has done over the past couple of years to get to a place where we have standard work that we do. Uh, and so I'm going to hand it over to Emily in a minute to kind of walk through our update and then we're happy to answer whatever questions the board has. So the last time we were here in October, um, we provided a programmatic update, and that was followed by a presentation of HIV plan in November. Uh, so we thought we'd touch on a couple of highlights that have happened uh, since we were here last. 
So the first is just to highlight that Eva and Vital met all of the requirements of Act 187 of 2018. We reported on our progress uh, toward that end a number of times last year. Um, and then the final reports for requirements were submitted in January. That was a, a, a report on consent, which the NOTA presented to you, as well as a report on interoperability of systems, um, which is a topic that we covered um, in great detail in the Health Information Exchange Plan. And that's all been completed. Um, we have convened the 2019 Health Information Exchange Steering Committee, and as you remember, this is the group of people that's behind the Health Information Exchange statewide plan. Um, so the new governance models outlined, outlined in that plan, and we're really grateful uh, to folks who have joined us again and new uh, new members. Um, as I mentioned, our 2019 contracts are underway, so I thought I would touch on a couple of highlights of that agreement. And um, Mike and Frank did a great job of highlighting um, some partnership work that's uh, happening to develop sort of foundational HIV infrastructure in the landscape. That's really in the planning phases now, but we're pretty confident um, that we can get to a place that more efficiently uses resources and maximizes the sort of benefit um, or technical of the technical output um, that we're all seeking here. And finally, we thought we'd touch on a couple of things that we're keeping in mind, federal rule changes that are coming down, as well as um, changes in federal funding. Cool. Just to stop on this slide for a moment, um, I, I'm so pleased with, um, in a way, how boring this slide is. Um, because we just want to be confident and we want it to be boring. That, that said, there's a lot here, and I think there's a lot of listening from the legislature and this board of policymakers said, hey, stop telling us about HIE, show us what you can do. Uh, and so to meet all the Act 187 requirements is a big deal for us. Um, the steering committee was basically this board and others saying, if you're gonna run this program, you have to listen to what people want. I, I think that's still a work in progress, but we're trying really hard to listen to what folks in the healthcare ecosystem want with HIE, and so I'm pleased that that's continuing. With vital contracts, um, I, I was so pleased that one of those slides said that they hit 100% of deliverables. We've, as you know, made the transition from a grant to a deliverables-based contract. There's no guarantee that that's going to be successful, so we're really grateful to Vital and the team to hit all their marks on that. And then um, I think one concern from this board and from the legislature is that we're, you know, we have, we're at risk of being working in silos and buying the same thing three or four times, and so. The fact that we're pursuing a shared infrastructure, which Mike and the team went into in uh, more detail, is a really big deal. Um, my contribution to that was quite modest. It was to bring everybody to the same room and say, hey, we have a checkbook and we're not going to pay twice. There has got to be some sort of way for really smart people to figure out how to share common resources the way that was originally envisioned with the creation of the Vermont Health Information Exchange. And so I'm, I'm grateful that there's a whole bunch of people doing hard work and taking risks to try to bring that to reality. Uh, and then, you know, Corey, uh, Commissioner Gusterson likes to say that, you know, he's like the mayor of Athens and I'm the deputy mayor along with Cass Madison and the feds are like Zeus, you know. And so I, I do think it's important we keep our eye on what they're doing because they, they really just, based on their financial commitments, play an outsized role um, in how and when we develop health information exchange and technology. So we have the 2019 work of the Health Information Exchange Steering Committee. Um, those are the, the committee goals here, those are straight from the Health Information Exchange Plan. Um, but there's a couple that I thought um, we should focus on. Predominantly, their goal to draft a technical roadmap that reflects a three to five year um, IT investment strategy. And this is really essential, a way to build off of the work that was done last year in the strategic plan um, as we targeted the mystification of health information exchange and really setting statewide goals. So this year, the steering committee is going to come together and say, OK, well, we've defined what we want, what we're trying to achieve. Let's define how we're going to get there. So this is a deeper dive, one level further down, to think about how we're really investing in technology to get to shared goals. And so that's a requirement for us to really understand how we finance and ultimately how we make this sort of ecosystem sustainable and what the state's role in that sustainability is. Um, 
So yesterday we awarded a contract to uh, a partnership group, a consultancy, Lantana Consulting. Um, one of their CEO helped us a bit last year with technical aspects of the HIV plan. And her company has partnered with Velatora, which is an offshoot of the Michigan Health Information Network. And if you remember, um, perhaps going back to Don Gallagher's presentation from her 2017 evaluation, Michigan's really held up as one of the national models, not just in how they do technology, but really how they plan a new governance. Um, they're the sort of the originator of what they call the use case factory, which was a concept that we took here in Vermont and said, okay, so let's base our strategic planning on use cases or how we use health information exchange. So we're really excited about this partnership. Um, they should get started in the next few weeks and they'll be guiding the steering committee through that development of the roadmap and potentially other work related to their, their experiences. Um, so we'll be back here November 1st with an update to the Health Information Exchange Plan. It will include um, what we've accomplished in terms of that tactical plan at the end. It says, you know, sort of who's role, um, where in the foundational exchange services and end user services that role lands, what activity they're going to accomplish for the year, and then how we want to build on it in 2020, um, as well as to update with the technical roadmap. Okay. And I'm a bit of an EOR. I mean, I think it, it's easy to get excited about uh, technological innovation in HIE. And so it really has a great team. And they'll say, hey, Michael, we really want to talk to you about blockchain. And I'm sitting there going, hey, we're still trying to put the building blocks together of what do we want? Why do we want it? How do we evaluate what to invest in given scarce public resources and the fact we have a very definite healthcare reform direction? And then, okay, what's our three to five year roadmap to build it? And, and both, so we know what we're doing and when we're doing it, but we can test our own competency in trying to bring some of these uh, programs and projects to life. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those things in health information exchange and technology where it's pray, but move your feet. You know, keep thinking big thoughts, but keep moving towards really incremental progress in building capacity and competency of what we do. Any questions about this? Um, I think probably just the most important thing, thing to point out here is that we now have a strategic plan that aligns with what we're asking of our biggest vendor, the operator, the health information exchange. Um, so if you look at the top right here, that is the um, IT services model that we have in the health information exchange plan. And it's just meant to show that, you know, there's sort of baseline services, foundational services um, in health information exchange like security or identity management. There's exchange services that are sometimes offered by multiple vendors. Um, that's where you think of pulling the data together, making sure, making sure it's of high quality and making sure it's accessible. And then on the top of that, you can only build those services once the foundational and exchange services are in place. The sort of um, the more exciting things, consumer tools, portals, analytic tools, actual use of the data. So all of the items that the state is asking of vital this year are in direct alignment with that services model. So you see here, we've got the contract split into sort of two pieces, maintenance and operations of the health information exchange system itself, um, and then systems development and enhancements. And I think Mike and Frank went over um, our operational goals for this year to continue to automate the consent process so it's easier to transmit consent preferences and thereby increasing the consent rate. And our goal for this year is 42%, last year was 35%, and as I don't mention, they exceeded that goal for the last year. Yeah. I would say, though, um, that if you look at those foundational services and consent is one of them, the slide that Vital had up on the screen was, we have goal 35, we've exceeded that goal, we're now pushing towards goal 42. Um, our understanding of the national landscape is that in states that have um, opt-out consent, the numbers that we're talking about are 92, 93, and 95. And so it's really about how solid a foundation you want to build. I'm very respectful of the fact that people can disagree on the merits of the policy, but we really do look at it as a foundational piece of the program, and it's hard to imagine driving to the proper level of success in those other aspects of that diagram if you do not um, have a consent policy in place that might get you to scale. Uh, there, Vermont is one of a handful of states that has opt-in consent. Most states have opt-out. Uh, and it's our understanding that two out of the three states, the other two from Vermont, um, Rhode Island and 
Nevada or are actively considering changing their consent policy. So we'll be respectful of the fact that folks want to have more conversation about it. That's understandable. We want to do it right, not just fast. But there's a pretty stark, as we've said before, um, before this board, there's a, a Vermont is significantly out of step policy-wise, and we think there's a big programmatic impact to that policy choice. <coughs> Another operational goal for the year is to continue to reduce duplicate records, but I think Frank Wonders who be, um, might put into that in greater detail. So when we think about developing the system, building on what, on what we already have, um, there's a couple of areas. And you know, we call these systems development in part because of how they're funded. Um, anything that falls under systems development is funded by the federal government at a 9010 rate. Um, so they're, they're um, partnering with us to continue to enhance our health information exchange. So a couple of highlights here, data access. I think, you know, Vitals always worked to make the data accessible through their provider portal, and now they're really thinking about how to make data accessible in the electronic health record. So if you just put yourself in a provider's shoes, do you want to have an extra login? Do you want to go to another system? Or do you want to just look at the electronic health record that you're using with your patient at the time? And they really prioritize um, making data accessible in a way that's going to be <coughs> useful to providers. Um, on data aggregation, um, you know, the connectivity criteria was part of our health information exchange plan. It set some standards um, for the, the quality of, and the volume and the accessibility of the data coming from electronic health systems to that exchange and aggregation center. Um, and so the way that that connectivity criteria has developed in the last couple of years, I think is really admirable. And Vital is committed to developing work plans with each healthcare organization that they're going to work with this year to get them on a track to continue to develop towards higher and higher tiers of connectivity criteria, which um, just in terms of our public role, I think is a really great way um, to sort of get the outcomes that we want, the most accessible and highest quality of data in the exchange server. Um, and then on data quality, um, we will be compensating Vital for the project that they've detailed, a portion of it um, related to sort of translating data for use, it's called terminology services, and making sure that the records are where they should be. Um, so that's part of their partnership work, um, but you know we're confident that they are uh, they committed to uh, sort of the, the foundational aspects of shared infrastructure that are going to really make a difference to quality um, and usefulness of the data. So moving on, just look, a quick look at um, sort of national level changes that we're keeping in mind as we. Um, think about day-to-day -day HIE operations and planning with the steering committee. Um, the first is one that we talked about before. The High Tech Act originated in 2009, and it's really why, what incentivized the purchase and use of electronic health record systems across many as aspects of the healthcare system, and then ballooned, and that's the federal funding that we use today for things like the Health Information Exchange. That funding expires in 2021. And what CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, has said is we know that this work, you know, there's still a lot of work to do nationally, nationwide, and we still want to be a part of it. Um, so they're trying to create an avenue where funding is available through Med Medicaid Enterprise Services. You guys might know we have an MMIS or claims system that sort of is the back end of Medicaid. So this is going to impact our federal share, and it's also going to impact the types of projects that we want to, um, we want to do. Uh, because they have a couple of years ahead of them, there's not formal guidance out yet, um, but CMS is certainly making a lot of changes to adjust for this at this point, um, and we'll have to change for it as well. Um, the CMS and Office of the National Coordinator, the ONC, have also come out with some rules um, to further drive interoperability or that exchange of data across systems and patient access to, to data. They're just in the proposed rulemaking phase, um, but these will have a pretty significant impact on payers, um, on uh, the sharing of sort of data standards for what allows for exchange across systems, and potentially how um, Medicaid and Medicare patients can access their own data. Um, so we're keeping a close eye on this one. Uh, I think the, um, the comments from the rules are due in early May, so probably a couple of months after that we'll have more formalized guidance. Um, and this dovetails with the 21st Century Cures Act. 
um, the Trusted Exchange Framework, or TECPA. Um, this has been a topic that was highly talked about over the last couple of years. It's um, a mandate of the Office of the National Coordinator to kind of think about how nationwide exchange happens, and some of the new proposed rules will enforce this, and potentially the federal government will come out with more formalized guidance on how we'll achieve TEPCA, um, which will um, force us to think a lot about the role of the health information exchange here in Vermont and how that interacts um, with nationwide networks. Just to go back to the first piece of it, um, I think one of the things for this board to consider or just be aware of. Uh, if you're running Medicaid, right, if you're a Medicaid administrator, you're constantly wearing two hats. One is the hat of Medicaid the payer, just like Blue Cross Blue Shield or MVP or Medicare. Um, we enroll people, we enroll providers, we pay when people need medical services. <clears throat> but we also have on the hat of, you know, being responsible to some extent for the healthcare system. And that's where we do HIE work in service of providers. Uh, there is an internal challenge in bringing together those two streams of work. Because right now, HIE work is not that well connected to MMIS. <coughs> and so I think one challenge um, that you know, my successor will have in Medicaid is making sure that uh, one thing does not swallow the other thing, that we maintain a proper focus on things we're building in service of providers as opposed to things we're building in service for our role of a payer. And it's just going to be important not to lose any momentum in this work as the federal funding streams change. So that's a bad reason to lose programmatic momentum. So that's our responsibility, but one that you should be aware of. And with TEPCA, you know, we have to keep being mindful of federal changes in policy and postures. I, I do think um, our informal conversations with the federal government generally go like this. Hey, we expect to see some level of connection between the states and across the nation. We, you know, we don't want to pay for 50 plus silos of healthcare information. It's not, I don't think anybody would disagree with that, but how you do it really matters. And so we have to be ready for whatever comes at us from the federal level as they try to encourage data and connection to be more portable and transferable across the states. Uh, that was our whole update. Yes. <laughs> that was our whole update. Any questions? Any questions from the board? Tom? Um, I just wanted to uh, join Kevin in applauding the work that you've done, Michael. I, you and I have not crossed paths in person very often, but I remember reading about the Blue Ribbon Tax Commission, which is an area I knew something about, and seeing that Kathy Hoyt and Bill Sear were going to be um, a part of the team, and I thought, well, this is going to be very interesting to watch. And uh, when the report came out, um, I just found it to be um, really well done, um, and uh, I applaud you for that. And then as I kind of joined this arena, um, I have found that there's just a lot of integrity in your work, and uh, I just want to applaud you for that because uh, Vermont is lucky to have had you, and we are lucky not to lose you. Um, and uh, you know, thankfully, we'll be seeing you from another direction. I do have a question just about continuity. Um, we've talked in the past about um, the steering committee, the whole issue of continuity um, from the beginning to the end was important. And do you have any um, insights that you can offer us as to uh, uh, how your role in that might be replaced or restructured? Uh, so first of all, thank you um, for your role, which is it is easy to look smart when you have know, people like Emily Richards and Alicia Cooper and others that you know working so hard. Um, and so, you know, I think that at the program level, there's going to be a lot of continuity. Um, I certainly don't want to get in front of Commissioner Masterson of the Governor's Office. I, I do think that the number one thing, if we're going to recall, that we're talking about in my successor is continuity. Um, we focus on how to restructure my job roles um, to make sure they're manageable for folks. And then we focus pretty heavily on internal candidates who would be able to hit the ground running because we don't want the momentum on payment and delivery system reform, particularly and we view HIE as a form of delivery system reform, uh, to lose any, any momentum because of um, the change in leadership. 
So I, I think I would urge you to stay tuned. I think we'll cut the don't fog your news on this soon, but it will hopefully be well calibrated to maintain momentum. Um, at the HIA steering committee specifically, but across payment delivery system reform more generally. Any other questions or comments from the board? If not, we'll open it up to the public for any questions or comments. Dale. I think this fits, but it's going to seem a little bit like it doesn't fit. It, it's a broader issue that I was tuned into through somebody that works in genetics and, and hence um, the issue I'm about to bring up. With all these data projects and the collection of the data, and as previously noted in the last presentation, and was mentioned in this one, opt-in versus opt-out is part of what makes this all work because they need data. But when you collect data like that, a door opens to something that we may or may not have considered, and that is eugenics practice through data. And it's very troubling. And Vermont has a history of having done that. I don't believe they would want to do it again. But it is highly probable that with this kind of data, if they're going to have an opt-in so that all these things work the way they want them to work, how do we control what they do with the data so it doesn't get mis misused? And the eugenics brought home to me just how important an issue this is. It's like, wow, there's a lot of room for real damage. Well, I hope that we've learned from past history and we don't repeat mistakes in the past. But also, um, if you're truly concerned about that, um, I don't. I don't want to use the term paranoid, but if if you truly feel that way, you still would have the ability to opt out if the policy were to change. But I don't know, Michael. Do you want to address that question? Well, I I would just say um, briefly that I just wouldn't want to mix up the issues of the manner in which consent is given, opt-in and opt-out, with permissible uses of the data, which are governed by federal and state law. Uh, I'm not trying to diminish your concerns in any way, just to say that to me those are really separate issues. And um, There's nothing about the consent policy that's being contemplated right now that would change state or federal law about the permissible uses of the data. Uh, I, I defer to the general counsel of the board for the specifics around HIPAA and state law, but um, I think it's a really important distinction to make, Dale, when we're talking about the consent policy. Okay, other questions from the public? Comments? Michael. Yeah, I apologize. I, I don't mean to uh, occupy all the time. I neglected to pile on with the, with the, um, Thanks, thanks for uh, Michael Costa's job. You know, I, I didn't know Michael before I came to this position. I have known him to be cool, calm, and collected no matter what the situation is. You know, for those who've worked with me, just like I am most of the time. Um, the, the, the one thing that I, I like about Michael is his intellect at looking at issues, even in an adversarial position, the ability to sort of think through the various issues. And it will be a loss for state government, but it will be a gain for the healthcare system. And I really appreciate the time that I got to spend with Michael. Now we only have to I would just note for the record that Mike's initial reaction I news was somewhat less tempered. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like it, I'm not 
not so sure we should do that. <laughs> <laughs> it is after, after all televised. <laughs> okay, thank you. And, and I would note, um, as you all know, I'm just going to St. John's Fair, so I won't be far. Um, and I'm really excited to continue on the healthcare reform journey. Uh, and I'm leaving Diva feeling really good about the team that we have. I just, you, know, you, you know, you just don't get anywhere in this business without a good team. And so I think I'm really excited for folks to be able to step up and, and keep that momentum going in partnership with the board and others. Okay, got anything else from the public? Seeing none, thank you. And, uh, thank you very much. Emily, I guess we'll be seeing you again. <laughs> <laughs> Advocate 
and then a response from One Care Vermont uh, to the comments from the healthcare advocate. Um, I will just also note that packets of our information, our slides, and also both of the written public comments are available outside. They are stapled together as one packet. And all of this information is also posted on our website um, under the meeting materials section. So if anyone has any questions or want to look at this in more detail. That being said, I'm going to do my best to summarize the information um, that was stated in the public comments and apologies ahead of time if uh, I miss anything. Um, the healthcare advocates comments, the general focus was that the requested change that one care has asked for in actuality reduces one care's um, public health management investments by $3.7 million. Uh, the healthcare advocate noted that Vermont, the Vermonters do have a significant need for uh, the public health management investments. In their comment was that 2018 spending should not be set aside due to implementation delays, which was one of the things that One Care talked about in its presentation. Um, and the request from the healthcare advocate was that all unspent money should be used to increase One Care's population health budget for the coming fiscal year. One Care Vermont's response to that public comment, um, the highlights are as follows. One Care agrees that the investment in public health and prevention initiatives is very important. Um, not including the value-based initiative fund, uh, which was not included in what One Care's value-based incentive. Sorry, <laughs> value-based incentive fund spending that One Care did not include in its presentation. They did spend more than twenty-one million dollars in population health programs in 2019 or 2018. One Care does not have any additional unspent funds um, in, on their books or sitting within their bank accounts. Um, and any increase in spending for 2019 that uh, might be contemplated beyond what is in the already approved 2019 budget would require additional revenue be collected from hospitals who are in large part funding all of the spending that is going on um, in population health management issues. Um, so that's basically where we're at, I think, at this point. We're happy to answer any questions board members of the public might have to the extent we can. We also have representatives from One Care here who uh, I'm going to volunteer them to answer questions that people may have. Um, so I think I'll turn it back to you. Okay. I guess the logical question is to one care, since they have so much care, um, if they feel that um, their ability for success in the future has been adversely affected by the inability to make these uh, population health investments. So this is Tom Morris, Director of Finance for Healthcare. I don't think so at all. I think, in fact, we've had a very successful uh, 2018 operation. And for the timing of program rollout, changes to attribution, um, et cetera, participation in the primary care pilot, for example, uh, the ratio that we've achieved was less than what the budget order uh, required. But I believe that it was a, a very successful year and that we rolled out all the programs through tremendous growth period. and are continuing to evolve and grow as we, we hit stride in 19. So I do not see the results of 2018 in any way as a detriment to 2019 and the future performance of the ACL. Okay. Other questions from the board? Okay. Any other? Uh, Questions or comments from the public? Seeing none. Is there anyone who would like to make a potential motion? I can do it if you'd like. Uh, would you prefer one or two motions? <laughs> I'd be later to do two. Okay. Um, then I will start with. 
moving to approve the requested amendment to order F4 uh, by reducing the reserve requirement to 1.4 million by December 31st. Okay. Is there any discussion? I, I had a comment on it um, that I would say, I. Uh, in terms of my thinking about this, is I think when we approved the budget, there were a number of unknowns that we talked about two weeks ago when we were here in terms of uh, the, what the Medicare program would require in terms of backstops as well as uh, the reinsurance-like uh, protection that one care ultimately got. And so I think that combined with uh, seeing how the risk model has rolled out uh, for me makes me comfortable that um, that this reduction makes sense um, and doesn't uh, pose a potential risk uh, to the program uh, also i think when it comes to reserves we have to be careful about it both ways we want to make sure there's enough reserves but we also don't want to over reserve because um, i think that then may not be the, the best investment of the dollars. So that's my comment. Is there a second to the motion? No, sorry. Second. <laughs> okay, other discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, member one. Okay, um, I'll move that we amend order H to adjust the percentage of spending from 3.1% to 2.5% on the population health reform and payment reform programs. Is there a second? Second. So we moved and seconded. Mm -hmm. Is there a discussion? Again, I'll, I'm happy to comment on my thinking on this one. Uh, I think when we did this part of the order. The other thing we should all remember is that we also separately included in the order that uh, $7.5 million be uh, spent on the blueprint for health and SASH. And we did it in that two-part way because we wanted to ensure that that money that, quite frankly, in the, in the negotiation had been intended to go to the blueprint and SASH programs did that. So it, I just wanted to point out that that amount is not reflected in the ratio. Um, I think I certainly am very concerned about the proportion of spending that goes into the population health investments. That is a very important and innovative part of this model and I think um, is necessary for us to, to really keep an eye on. However, this was the first year. We have to expect that there will be operational issues and uh, rolling out a number of programs um, obviously can, can create some of those operational issues. So given the, that it's the early years, this is the first time that we tried to do this kind of proportional order as well as um, kind of a ramp up period, um, that it's those components that make me comfortable with this. Okay, other discussion? I just might add to that that um, I fully agree with what Robin said that this was the first year and uh, it was a, a growth year as it's 19. I mean, we're, um, and I, but I haven't heard a complaint from any of the potential recipients of this, these additional funds in 2018 complaining that they didn't get their funds. Um, Rise, for example, was one that um, didn't receive its full allotment, but it seems to me from what I've heard is that Rice wasn't ready to receive his full allotment. And so end of the fiscal year came, this amount had not been necessary to build into hospitals and we moved on into twenty nineteen. So it just seems like a simple administrative you know cleanup here and uh, that's why I support it. Other discussion. If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you very much.
Is there any old business to come before the board? <coughs> Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. It's been moved by Member Holm, seconded by Member Eusper to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone.